Grant Shifter's Elite Book 6 by Ava Benton. Chapter 1. Daniela. You'd better keep me posted on this baby. Nia placed one hand against Layla's stomach, which Layla covered with her own. She smiled through her tears. I will. You'll get sick of updates in no time. Hum. I don't think that's possible. She wrapped her arms around our friend's shoulders and rested her head against Layla's shoulder. I love you. I stood off to the side and was pretty sure my heart would break. It felt surreal watching my best friend leave. And for Montana of all places. But that was where Drew was going and she had to be with him. I told myself to understand. I didn't think she actually wanted to leave us. She wanted to be with him. Two different things. It just so happened that one made the other impossible. Life happened that way sometimes. She turned to me. And you gorgeous. Stop it, I grinned. My chin trembled. Take it easy on these new guys around here, huh? I've seen the way they follow you around with their eyes, practically drooling. Don't break too many hearts, okay? I'll keep an eye on her, Layla promised with a wink. I tried to joke with them. I didn't want Nia's last moments with us to be full of tears. We had been through too much together to end things that way. But I was never good at goodbyes, either. My chin trembled again, and my vision blurred as tears filled my eyes. Come here, you. Nia enveloped me in a tight hug, and I clung to her. Layla joined us and we stood there, locked together for a long time. I wished more than anything that she didn't have to go, but I understood why it was important to her. Some friend I would be if I made a big deal about it. She was happy, and I was happy for her. It was just that I was miserable for myself at the same time. Alice waited behind Nia. I reached for her when our hug was over. And you. And me. Thank you. I gave her a tight hug too. Thank me? For what? I should be thanking you. I pulled away and held her at arm's length. You started this whole thing, bringing Roan and the others to us. You got Jordan back with his family. And now we don't have to be afraid anymore. All because of you. Her cheeks burned as red as her hair. Nobody would be thanking me if things hadn't gone the way they did. But they did go the way they did, and everybody's fine. I hugged her again. Be happy in Montana, okay? She snorted. It's gonna be weird, living with the whole family. In the same house? I axe eyes wide. Hope lived in a cabin just off property while they added a new wing to their house. So I'll live there with Carter. Maggie and Slate will be in another one further off, and Drew and Nia will take the house. I think Jordan will live there too, until all the construction is finished. Wow. Must be nice. I grinned. It sounded like they had all the money in the world. The girls got lucky in more ways than one. I was happy for them, too. Hope and Maggie seemed nice, and it was good for Alice to have people around who were like her, human. Are you sticking around, she asked. I nodded. Not much else to do right now. It's time to figure out where to go from here. Can you see yourself leaving the group? Really? Ever? I don't know. There are a lot of things I never thought would ever happen. My whole life feels like one big surprise. She laughed. Maybe there are more surprises left, huh? Maybe. She put an arm around my shoulders, and we walked over to where Jordan was saying goodbye to everybody. They gathered around him like he was a messiah. I guessed he was. Didn't messiahs save people? He had saved all of us. He had protected us when we lost our parents, he had trained most of us to control ourselves and not let our animal side rule us. If it wasn't for him, we'd all be dead. Or most of us, anyway. Those who weren't would probably be in prison or chained up like freaks. I understood the looks on the faces of some of them. Betrayal. Hurt. I felt the same way, maybe to a lesser degree, but it was there. I would get over it. So would they. But it would take time. You know, 
you could always come out to Montana, Jordan was saying as we walked up. There's plenty of room out there, lots of land. We can work that out, Lance replied with a grin. Lance looked shell-shocked, eyes a little too wide, smile a little too bright. Like oh gee, this is actually happening. I'm actually taking on this massive responsibility. I reminded myself that he did a great job with the mission in Washington, and he had stepped up in a huge way with Layla once he found out about the baby. But he loved her, so that wasn't such a big deal. He only did what any decent guy would have done. I caught Jordan looking him up and down with a funny smile. Yes, you have a lot to work out. Better you than me, buddy. I wondered if I was the only one who noticed, and figured I probably was. I was used to noticing things other people didn't. Like the way Lance looked ready to throw up. He would lead us and he would do an excellent job, I was sure of that, but he was scared to death at the same time. He usually chomped at the bit for the chance to take over when Jordan wasn't around, but it had never been permanent before. There was always the knowledge that Jordan would come back. Not this time. It hurt a little to think that Jordan was looking forward to leaving, but it wasn't that he was looking forward to leaving us. He was looking forward to living with his family, really getting to know them. He was just as pleased as anything that his sons had found mates to. The romantic side of me was thrilled for him, really thrilled. He had been through so much, sacrificed so much, but it was all finally paying off. It gave me hope, too. We might all find our happy endings. So why didn't everybody else feel hopeful? I didn't see much hope on the faces of the people around me. My pack, my family. We were breaking up, or would be pretty soon. It was supposed to be a happy time but all I saw was anxiety. Uncertainty. What were we supposed to do? We should get going, Roan murmured to Jordan. He flashed a smile to the group. It's been nice getting to know all of you. Finding out there were so many more of us out here was special. Take care of yourselves. He shook hands with Lance before getting in one of the large cars waiting to take them to the jet. They definitely traveled in style. My stomach clenched. They were leaving for real. I gave Nia one more hug before shooing her into the car with Drew. Layla would probably take her place. Nobody ever named Nia the alpha female of the pack, but we all knew she was. Somebody had to fill in the hole she was leaving. Layla would, just like Lance would fill in for Jordan, and somebody would take his place as unofficial alpha male to lead the group when Lance wasn't able to. Life would go on the way it always did. I just wish there was a place for me somewhere. The sun was warm, but that didn't stop me from shivering as I watched the cars pulling out of the campsite. Jordan waved one more time. Nia pressed her palm to the window, looking at Layla and me. I could barely see for the tears in my eyes. I felt a presence next to me. I didn't think they would really go. Doesn't that sound ridiculous? I glanced up at Grant, who stood with his hands in his pockets and his shoulders slumped. They said they would. That was the plan since we got back here. Yeah, I know, but it didn't feel real until now. I snorted. And you've been with us for what ten days? Two weeks, he corrected. Imagine how we feel then, I whispered, watching as dust clouds rolled up into the air, marking the progress of the SUVs carrying Jordan's family away. I would have sworn somebody was squeezing my heart, it hurt that much. I can't imagine. You're right. He didn't say anything else, but he didn't need to. We understood each other. That was one thing I could count on. Even though I barely knew him and vice versa, we could look at each other and understand. I was good at reading people, and so was he. I'm happy for them, I choked out. I know. So why do I feel so bad? Because you're not a robot. You feel things. And you're gonna miss them. I already do. We turned away and followed some of the stragglers as they wandered off, away from the center of our part of the site. We would pack up and move on soon. Lance had already pointed out that we were wearing out our welcome. The owners of the camp didn't ask many questions, so that was a plus. But there was a limit to hospitality 
and we didn't want to take things too far. Better for us to leave on our own than to be thrown out. Even I knew that. Everybody walked so slowly. They all looked a little lost. We had depended on Jordan for so long. I gave Lance what I hoped was a reassuring smile when I walked past his cabin. It used to be Jordan's, of course. Grant stayed by my side as I wandered down to the lake. It's funny, being here without having to worry about patrols and all that, I said, kicking stones out of my way. That's how it was before. Yeah. We were waiting on the bad guys to come and get us, or try to. And they did try. Two of them. Now we can just. I don't know. Enjoy ourselves. He chuckled. You make it sound like a bad thing. He was right. I guess it's not something I know how to do. Just being. I don't know how to just be. I know the feeling. You do. We stepped out of the woods and reached the shore of the lake. It was a little stony, a little sandy, but the water was cool on my feet once I took off my sandals. I wriggled my toes as the water lapped over them. Sure. Last time I was with my clan we were at war, or close to it anyway. We always had to look over our shoulders. There was never time to just take a deep breath and be. I looked at him and smiled. You can now. You're right. He kicked off his shoes and splashed in the ankle-deep water. I squealed when some of it hit me and splashed him back. He was always so serious, sort of sad. Seeing him let loose was a fun change. But that had to end eventually. We stood there, smiling at each other like two kids. His eyes were so blue, so impossibly blue like the sky just before twilight. We'd have to end eventually too, whatever weird thing there was between us. I bent down and cupped my hand, letting the water run through my fingers the way I felt like my life was running away from me. I don't know what to do now, I whispered. I couldn't remember ever feeling so hopeless. He came to me and touched my shoulder. I know how that feels. I think we all do. I looked out over the water, then further out to where mountains stretched up to the sky. It was supposed to be good, you know? When we dealt with the guys who were trying to find us, and when we destroyed the lab, it was supposed to make us all happy. I feel like I should be happy, but I'm not. It's such a letdown. And I dreamed about the day I would be able to leave that lab, he confessed in a quiet voice. You have no idea how many times I dreamed about it, visualized it. Imagined what I would do to the doctors and soldiers. It got pretty bloody in my dreams. Well that happened. I mean, you didn't get the chance to do it yourself but I heard how nasty it got in there. It was a bloodbath, he murmured. I turned my head just enough to see his face. His jaw was set tight and his nostrils flared. And now? I ax. He sighed. Sometimes it's like I'm still there. I guess it's possible to feel one way, when things are really another way. I guess so. Everything rose up in my chest, and I couldn't breathe all of a sudden. Like a wave rising up, up, until it crashed over me and drowned me. I've never felt this alone. I leaned against Grant's chest with a choked sob. You're not alone, he murmured. You have Layla. And all the rest of them. When his arms closed around my back, I didn't stop him. It felt natural, and I needed the comfort so badly. And you have me, if that means anything. It means a lot, I whimpered between sobs. It did mean a lot. More than I knew what to do with. Daniela. Where were you guys earlier? Layla raised an eyebrow. I was walking again, this time with her. She needed the exercise what with being pregnant, and to stretch her legs. Sometimes they ached for no reason, the doctor Mary had helped her find, around an hour away from our camp, told her that would happen sometimes. That she needed to keep walking, to keep them from swelling. Otherwise, she was as healthy as could be. It was such a relief after what she went through in the lab. Me and Grant? You know I'm talking about you and Grant. She elbowed me. Come on. Walking. Like we are now. We went to the lake and goofed around for a little bit. 
Goofed around? Or fooled around? She giggled. Goofed. Just goofed. He's fun to be with. And I think he needs a little more fun in his life, too. He's so serious all the time, did you notice? I can't say I know much about him. I haven't spent the time with him that you have. Ha ha. I rolled my eyes. I mean it, though. He said his clan was practically at war when he got kidnapped by those bastards. I wonder what happened to them since then. Where did he live? She asks. Florida, but he was traveling through Chicago when he was abducted. He doesn't remember much about it. She pursed her lips. That seems like a pretty big thing to forget. I couldn't have explained why, but my hackles went up. What's that supposed to mean? You don't believe him. Why wouldn't I believe him? Calm down. She chuckled, shaking her head. Wow. You've got it bad. I don't have anything. Just because you and Nia found your mates, don't try to hook me up with one. Okay, okay. Chill. We kept walking, but I couldn't let it go. It hung between us and made my skin prickly. You don't completely believe him though. Right? You think his story is a little sketchy. She blew out a heavy sigh. I guess he could have blocked it out. He doesn't even know how long he was in the lab, so who knows what they did to him or what they gave him. He might have lost a massive chunk of his memory. I wouldn't put it past those sick creeps. She rubbed her arms like she suddenly felt cold, even though the air was balmy. I shouldn't have even brought it up. I'm the one who acts, remember? Don't worry about it. I only spent a little more than a day there. I have nothing to be freaked out over, compared to some of the others who were in those cells. I guess. But that doesn't mean you didn't go through something awful, just because it wasn't as bad. She sometimes had nightmares. Then again, it had only been two weeks since we came back from Washington. I remembered a song my mom used to sometimes sing. About time healing everything. I linked one of my arms with hers. I keep wondering when he's going to want to go back home, I admitted. Maybe he won't want to. It's been two weeks, he's had plenty of time. True. Even so. Even so, he would tell you if he was thinking about it. Right? Yeah. I guess so. You sound worried. No joking, what's on your mind? He said his clan was near war, if not fighting one. When he was kidnapped, I mean. Right. You said that already. I chewed my lip as I tried to figure it out. So why hasn't he gone back yet? I mean if it were me, I'd be on the first flight. He can't just hop a plane. He doesn't have any money. True. Okay. So I'd hitchhike. Or walk. Or shift and run the whole way. Hide on a truck or a freight train. Something. You couldn't keep me away. I'd want to know what happened to my clan. You're right. I'd want to do the same thing. We walked along the gravel path between two rows of trees for a spell in total silence. For a while all I heard was the sound of our feet crunching the gravel and the birds saying goodnight to each other before the sun went down. But you know what, she added after a long time, he went through a lot. He might not be the same person now that he was before. You don't know him. Not the full him. Just the Grant who exists now. That's depressing, I muttered. It doesn't have to be. What if he doesn't want to be that other person anymore? This could be a new start for him. Just like it's a new start for all of us. She giggled softly. You could both start over again. Together. I warned you. I know, I know. I shouldn't try to throw the two of you together. Sorry, but I want my friend to be happy. I can't help it. Nosy. Stubborn. We burst out laughing and that was good. I needed to feel like we were still close, even though her life was so wrapped up in her pregnancy and Lance and helping him step up into his new position. If I had grown up like a normal human girl with friends and a love life, I would be used to dealing with my friends hooking up with guys and moving on to new things by now. 
but I had lost out on all those times, just like most of us had. Will we ever catch up with the rest of the world? I wondered. Catch up? I mean, will we ever be like the rest of the world? Like humans our age? I feel like I'm at a disadvantage. I have no work history. I don't even have a valid driver's license. We've been so cut off from the rest of the world. Where do we start making things normal? What's normal though? So what if we're not the same as the rest of the world? She would never understand how it felt to want to be like everybody else because she was comfortable being herself. Miss Flower Child, dancing under the full moon like her mom taught her when everything in her life fell apart. And that was all right for Layla if it made her happy. It just wasn't enough for me. Yeah. I guess so. But I need to be able to get a job one day. Granted. You could always go back to school, right? I shrugged. I guess. I mean, what would I do? I'm not good at anything. I was never very good in school. She took a few steps away from me, then stopped with her hands on her hips. Are you kidding? Or are you that unaware of yourself? I looked myself over. What are you talking about? She laughed, shaking her head. You've been living in the woods for like weeks and weeks. We were on the beach before that, and in the desert before that. We bathe whenever we can, wherever we can, and wash our clothes whenever we come across a laundromat which doesn't happen nearly enough. And you look like you just walked out of a salon in L.A. or something. I do not. She walked around me in a slow circle. Your hair has that beachy wave thing going on, which most girls would kill to have. I let it dry in braids after I wash it. And you wear a sundress and sandals, like you're on your way to a garden party. You even have a cute little sweater tied around your waist that matches the color on your finger and toenails. I like to match. Yeah, well, you look fantastic. Always. She was smiling when she stopped in front of me. What if you studied fashion design? Or you could go to beauty school. Do they even call it beauty school anymore? No idea. Doesn't matter, she decided. I think it's an extremely viable option, young lady. You're gifted. Share your gift. Make us all more beautiful. I cracked up. You're insane. Yeah, well, I know. She slung an arm around my shoulders. Come on. I told Lance I'd be back before it gets too dark, and he'll want you back too. I wrinkled my nose. He's a little overprotective, isn't he? He's adjusting to being in charge. Things will be a little different for a while, but he'll loosen up. Maybe. She shrugged. Hey, so we call it an early night unless we're hunting. No big deal? It's been a while since I hunted. I could use a hunt. Make sure you don't go alone, okay? He'll lose his mind. I don't feel like dealing with that. Okay. I dropped her off at the cabin she shared with Lance and watched with a sad smile as she walked in. No matter what happened, she had him and they were happy. They would make a life together. It was nice for her, but I couldn't hang around and feel like a third wheel forever. I needed to figure out something for myself. Carl and some of the other guys were putting together the night's bonfire and talking about going for a hunt later. I didn't want to go with all of them. Some of the guys tended to forget they weren't the only ones out there and didn't leave much for the rest of us. Maybe something Lance could talk about with them, since he wanted to be such a great leader. It wasn't until I walked around our section of the campsite that I figured out I was looking for Grant. Since when did that happen? I liked checking in with him at the end of the day. It was nice to talk with him about nothing important. I remembered the conversation I had with Layla and wondered if it was time to talk about important things. Like why he didn't want to go home. Chapter 3 Grant Wake up, Grant. I pried my eyes open and blinked against the bright white light shining in them. It felt like knives driving into my brain. I winced and tried to turn my head away, squeezing my eyes shut. Anything to make the pain go away. 
Still light sensitive, the voice near my head murmured. The clicking of a keyboard. Then, Grant, would you say the sensitivity has gotten worse since yesterday? I. I don't remember. I groaned, struggling to get away from that sharp, horrible light. Why wouldn't they turn it off if they knew how much it hurt? You don't remember yesterday, the voice murmured. Who was that? The doctor. Right. I was in the lab, like I had been for weeks. Months even. I had no idea how long. They came in and shaved my face every day and trimmed my hair too, so I couldn't even use that as a way to mark time. No, I grunted. Was I not speaking English? Boom. A whispered conference. I wasn't giving them the answers they had expected. But the doctor sounded excited. I could hear it in the way his voice kept getting louder, even though he was still trying to whisper. Probably one of the many things they were giving me was screwing with my memory. I had lost track already. They were shooting me up with so many different things. I used to try to fight it. I used to struggle and growl and spit at them. I even shifted the first time they made the mistake of releasing my restraints. That was a lesson we all learned the hard way. I wouldn't shift again. What they did to me hurt too much. It was easier to let them do what they wanted and hope it would all be over soon. I wished they would kill me, either on purpose or accidentally. It didn't matter as long as I didn't have to feel the pain anymore. We'll be testing your pain threshold later today, Grant. The doctor's voice was smug, like he was proud of himself for tying me down and torturing me. I ground my teeth and glared at him, even though the light was still stabbing my brain and it was easier to keep my eyes closed. I heard my heart rate picking up speed. The beeping got faster, faster and louder, until the sound filled the room and echoed off the hard walls and floors and tried to tear my mind apart. No. I woke with a start, covered in cold sweat. My pillow was soaked with it. So was the thin sheet under me. I had already kicked the blanket off and tangled it around my ankles. I stared up at the ceiling of the tent, breathing like I had just run a marathon. It's okay. You're out. You're out. You're never going back. It was my new mantra. I said it to myself every night, sometimes more than once. Every time the nightmares woke me up. It was useless to try to fall back asleep in a sweat-soaked sleeping bag. I rose and shook everything out, then pulled on a pair of cargo shorts and left the tent barefoot. Smelling the fresh air, looking up at the open sky, these things helped push the rest of the nightmare out of my head. For the time being. The rest of the camp was asleep, the way people usually were in the middle of the night. I looked at the wristwatch. No way I would ever let myself go without knowing what time it was ever again. I needed to know. I needed to hold on to all the real things I could. 4.30. Nowhere close to dawn. I sighed deeply and wondered what to do until then. And after that. And the next day. A walk to the lake was pretty much the best option. So I started through the thin patch of woods between the camp clearing and the deep cool lake. The idea of hunting crossed my mind, but I didn't think I would ever hunt alone again after what happened the last time I tried it. Especially not in a place I didn't know like the back of my hand. I peeled off my shorts and waded into the lake without thinking about it. I needed to wash off the dried sweat. I wished I could wash off the memories. Not just of the dream, but of what caused it. There were too many. I didn't know where to start. The smell of antiseptic. The way I could taste saline in the back of my throat whenever somebody flushed the line in my arm after injecting me with something that would screw with my brain or my body. That painfully bright light. I had the feeling I would like dark rooms for the rest of my life. I dove deep into the water and let myself rise slowly to the surface. I was completely alone in the center of the lake with nothing but water under me and the sky above me when I broke the surface. I let myself float on my back for a while, so I could stare up at that dark sky with the thousands of stars that looked down at me and probably remembered more about me than I did about myself. It wasn't that I didn't remember anything from my life. 
I knew I was an Everglade. I knew my home was in Florida. Vincent was the head of the clan. Pretty simple stuff. It was what happened after that night outside Chicago that was a blur. Maybe that wasn't a bad thing. Maybe I remember deep down inside, and the part of my brain in charge of keeping me sane knew it would be better if the memories never came out. I was fine with that. The little bit I did remember through my dreams was bad enough. I should go home, shouldn't I? The stars didn't have an answer. Nobody would. I'd have to answer for myself, not like I didn't know the right thing to do. I had to go. My clan was at war. But if Bradford Eastwing thought I was dead or at least gone forever, that wouldn't be a bad thing. It would be the best thing. I couldn't go home, knowing what he expected from me when I got there. The thought filled me with shame. I wasn't that sort of guy. A real man didn't run away from problems, Dad taught me that, and Vincent lived by it. I used to live by it, too. But it was one thing to tell yourself in theory that something was wrong, and another to experience actual, serious, life-or-death shit, and try living by the same principles. I had never faced anything like the trap Bradford set for me. It had sort of wiped everything clear and destroyed everything I thought I knew about myself. My skin was starting to prune. I turned from my back and swam to shore with long, slow strokes. Stretching my muscles still felt good after being locked up for so long. I wasn't even fast on the hunt anymore. Time would take care of it, just like it took care of all sorts of things. Except guilt. I felt a pang in my chest that I knew had nothing to do with the exertion of swimming across the still water. It would be morning soon. Right away, I pictured Daniela in my mind and smiled as I stepped onto the stony shore. Funny how she was the first person I thought of. I looked forward to seeing her again, even though I had only just seen her the day before and every day before that for two weeks. Whenever we said goodnight, I looked forward to seeing her again in the morning. I thought about the guys back home and what they would think if they knew about her. She was gorgeous, so they would assume it had to do with that and only that. Sure, she was the most beautiful girl I had ever met. I didn't think there were real live girls as beautiful as her. But it wasn't just the face or the body. And that was where the guys wouldn't believe me, or if they did they'd laugh themselves sick. Liking a girl because she was a good person. A sweet, kind, thoughtful person who had been there for me from the morning after the lab was destroyed and every day since. They would roll their eyes and tell me I was kidding myself, and maybe they'd be right about that. Maybe I was trying to make myself feel better for already caring way too much about her. I wondered if she knew she snored a little. I passed her tent, which used to belong to her and Layla, before Layla started sharing quarters with Lance. I could hear her soft snores coming from inside, and the sound made me smile to myself. She would probably be embarrassed if she found out. It would be my secret. I was used to having them, but nothing as innocent as this one. I sat down on the leaf-covered ground in front of the tent, legs crossed. I wasn't waiting for her, and I knew it looked like I was. Anybody who passed by would assume I was a stalker. I just wanted to be sure she was okay. Something about sitting out there, guarding her, made me feel more like myself. Like one of the good guys. You and I both know why you need to do this. Bradford's voice rang in my mind. I shook my head, hoping to clear him out but he was in too deep. His claws were hooked in, and there was no pulling them out. I remembered feeling cold inside like ice was forming in the pit of my stomach and only getting worse the longer I looked at him. The longer I breathed the same air he breathed. I had never been in his office before that moment, or in the club he owned. We Everglades made it a point to steer clear of him and his nasty crew. And they were nasty bastards too. They'd sell their own mothers if it meant making a profit. You can't make me, I'd muttered, even though I knew he could and he knew I knew. That was why he had smiled even wider. We'll see what the police think about it. Not to mention Vincent. What will he say when he knows you were the one who got his best friend killed? 
I clenched my teeth and told myself to forget it. Bradford didn't know I was alive. If I could stay away, I could start again. Maybe with Daniela, maybe without her. Either way, I didn't have to be under Bradford's thumb so long as I never showed up on his radar again. And I had no intention of doing that. Chapter 4 Daniela Lance sat down hard on the edge of the bed. That makes four more of us moving on. Deep frown lines creased his forehead. That's a good thing, isn't it? Layla sat at the table near the window. They feel like they can move on to other things. They feel secure enough now. Yeah. I know. He was still frowning, though. What's the real problem, she asks. Hey. I can leave, you know. This sounds like it's getting personal. I edged closer to the door, looking back and forth at the two of them. No, no. Lance smiled, though he still looked tired and discouraged. I knew he felt like he was losing his pack, just when he took leadership of it. Lance was a good man. A smart and strong and capable man. But he still compared himself to Jordan, so he always felt like he was coming up short. Layla and I had already spent hours talking about it. How much we both wished he would focus on what he could do, and not so much what Jordan would do in a situation. Seriously, don't worry about it. But Layla didn't look at me when she said it. She stared at Lance, concerned. One of her hands stroked her belly, which was starting to pop a little already. When I was being really honest with myself, in my heart of hearts, I knew I envied her. He loved her, and she loved him, and they were having a baby together. No, things hadn't gone the traditional way for them. They didn't even admit their feelings, until after the baby was conceived and after Layla was kidnapped by those shitheads. Still, they were happy. They had a future. But I didn't envy her right now. She had to find a way to make him feel better about losing his pack, the way he saw it, of course. Not really the truth. He was there to lead those of us who chose not to move on, and to encourage those who chose to leave. Jordan knew he would do well with that, but Lance still didn't understand it. Are you confirmed on where we'll go next? I ax, desperate to change the subject. Yeah, Jordan already staked out that spot in Santa Barbara, he reminded me. We'll go there for a while before moving on. Have you given any thought to my idea? Layla acts in a soft voice. Can we talk about this later, he asks. I'm totally ready to leave whenever you give the word, I reminded them. Don't sweat it, Layla said with a scowl. There was so much tension flying back and forth between them, I would have sworn I saw actual sparks. I wondered what her idea was, and would have bet just about anything that it had to do with Montana. Following Jordan and his family there. It made sense, and Jordan had offered, but no way would Lance do that unless he really had to. I would have bet anything on that, too. Okay. So. When are we pulling out? I act still trying to keep things light. It was getting harder and harder, and I was starting to feel ridiculous. Hum? Oh. Four days? Sounds good. I'll make sure everybody's aware. Great. Thanks. It was time to go. There was a fight brewing. A great big fight that I'd probably be able to hear from my tent if I listened hard. I didn't intend on listening hard. I intended to get the hell out of there, and pretend not to notice that the two of them were ready to get into it. Just as my hand touched the doorknob, it turned. I jumped back. Carl stuck his head in. Sorry to bother you, but there are two guys here. They're looking for somebody they lost a while back, and think he might have been one of the prisoners back at the lab. Lance shot up off the bed. They seem trustworthy, he asks. They're like us, he said. I could smell it on them right off. The story makes sense. Send them in, he said, shooting Layla a warning look. He wanted to make sure she was safe, just in case the shifters weren't trustworthy. She got up and stood behind him. In walked two men. I could smell the animal in them too, but the sight of them was enough to convince me. They were bigger than the average human in every way, 
tall, impossibly wide shoulders, muscles bulging everywhere. One of them had a thick mane of blonde hair, which just about begged for fingers to comb through it. Jeez. Clearly, I hadn't had sex in way too long. How can we help you? Lance asks, standing with his feet shoulder-width apart and his hands clasped behind his back. All business. My name is Jace Everglade, the blonde said. This is my cousin Cord. Both of them had golden eyes, almost supernaturally golden. Beautiful. Maybe you've heard of our clan, Cord said. I frowned and glanced over at Lance. He nodded firmly. Sure. Some friends of ours did a little work for your clan not long ago, down in Florida. That's right, Jay said with a slight smile. My father hired them to protect a human. And we're looking for one of our own. Wait a minute. Lance looked at Cord, then back at Jace. Are you telling me we have Everglade here? Cord held up his large rough hands. We're here in hopes the person we're looking for is with you. As far as we know, he disappeared outside Chicago, Jace explained. At the time, things were pretty tense within the clan. We were at war with another clan and my father didn't want him traveling. Too risky, you know. But he insisted because he said he wanted to help somehow. Make sure our Midwest branch was in a strong enough position to send extra bodies our way. Dad let him go. And we haven't seen him since. We know it's a long shot, Cord added, but it was something we had to follow up on. News got out about your group destroying that lab and setting the prisoners free. Good work, by the way. Yeah, great job, Jace agreed. We thought it was worth checking out. Maybe he was there. I mean, yeah, the lab was in Washington, and he was last seen in Chicago. Cord trailed off with a shrug. I felt sorry for the both of them. They wanted their friend back and were grasping at straws. Layla smiled, but it was a sad smile. Nobody released from the lab claimed they were affiliated with your clan. I'm sorry. We figured. It was worth a shot. Jace's hands found his hips as he blew out a long, depressed sigh. This was our last chance that Grant was out there somewhere. We had to try. Grant? Layla's head snapped around as she glared at me. Wait, Grant. We have a Grant here, Lance said. I mean, not to get your hopes up or anything, but there's a man here by that name. Blonde blue eyes, girls are always drooling over him. Wolf Shifter. Cord and Jace both winced. Close, Jace said. Grant was a tiger. And for some reason, that was a relief. I didn't know how to feel about how relieved that made me. Grant wouldn't leave with them because he wasn't who they were looking for. Lance shook his head. I'm sorry. No tigers here. I guess we should have cleared that up first, Cord chuckled darkly. Thanks anyway. We're sorry we wasted your time. Not at all, Layla said as she stood. We're going to have a barbecue tonight. You're welcome to stay. Lance nodded in agreement. That sounds good, Jay said shrugging. Cord grinned. Well, we're not flying back out until tomorrow, he said. And I could seriously go for some barbecue. And we could seriously use more hands to help set up the fire pits, Layla laughed. I laughed too, even though I felt sorry for them. The relief of knowing Grant wasn't leaving overshadowed my sympathy. That wasn't like me at all. There were voices outside the cabin, probably the rest of the group getting the fire pit set up for the barbecue, and they grew louder when I opened the door. I had to shield my eyes against the light from the late afternoon sun streaming down. Grant was out there, helping. I waved. He smiled. Until he saw who was behind me. Holy shit. Cord hissed. It's him. I don't believe this. Oh my god. Jace jumped down the rickety stairs and practically sprinted over to where Grant was standing. Cord too. They nearly tackled Grant in their excitement. Wait a second, Layla said, holding her hands to her head like she didn't believe what she was seeing. They said they were looking for a tiger, Lance muttered, shaking his head. I don't get it. He's definitely not a tiger. Right? Right, I whispered. But just the same, the two Everglades practically pissed their jeans when they saw him. What are the odds that he has a doppelganger? 
I need to figure this out. Lance went to them, everybody was watching at that point, and he had to elbow his way through the onlookers. Layla came to me, putting a gentle hand on my arm. It doesn't make any sense but they believe it's him, she said. Only he doesn't look half as happy as they are. No. He looks like they killed his dog. But he knew them, she whispered. He saw them and he knew them. I know, I said with a sinking heart. He knew them, and he was devastated when he saw them. I wished I knew why. Chapter 5 Grant I can't believe it's you, man. I'm so goddamn happy to see you. Jace gave me another fierce bro hug, and I forced another smile. He wanted me to smile, of course. He and Cord both did. Yeah, man. Me too. I couldn't breathe. I felt sick. How did they find me? And were they really happy? Or did they already know what I had done? They could, they might. Bradford could have told them. He would too, the bastard. He would stab me in the back. I watched their faces, their body language. Nothing they did made it seem like they were anything but glad to have found me. Why didn't you come right home when you got out? Cord axe. Jace nodded as he gave me a playful shove that would have knocked a full-grown human male on his ass. Yeah, or at least let us know you were still alive. We've been looking for you on and off for like a year. That crashed through the fog of panic in my brain. Wait. What? A year. Cord's smile faded. You didn't know. A year. I was about to throw up. I took a couple of steps back, away from them. I didn't know what I was trying to accomplish. I just had to put a little space between us. A year. I had lost an entire year. Man, you all right. Jace was frowning, exchanging worried looks with Cord. I fought to find the breath to answer him. Sorry, bro, but... I put a hand on my chest and forced myself to take a deep breath to the count of four, then hold it for another count of four. One of the tricks I had picked up in the lab to keep from losing my shit, especially when they had wanted me to lose my shit. Holding on to control had been the only little way I could fight back. But what? Jace put his hands on my shoulders, sought out my eyes. Hey. Look at me. But what? But. I didn't know until now how long I was there. A year. I was a year older. I had missed everything. Football season, baseball season, the holidays. All of it. You didn't know. How could you not know? They looked at each other, like I had just started speaking in tongues or something. They wouldn't let me know what day it was, what month. What year. Fuck it, I didn't even know what time it was. Ever. My voice sounded dead. Wow, buddy. I'm sorry. I didn't know. Cord rubbed a hand over the back of his neck, grimacing. That sounds like hell. Yeah, well, that's just for starters, I chuckled without any humor. It wasn't a funny situation. You gotta give me a minute to catch up in my head. A year. Fuck me. Jace looked around and pointed to a picnic table with a long bench on either side. Here. Let's sit. I thought he might help me walk over there, like I was a cripple all of a sudden. I made it a point to wave them off and walk there on my own. I didn't know where to start, and neither did they. I saw it written all over their faces. They hadn't expected me to drop that on them. Well, good, because I hadn't expected them to show up and ruin everything I had been planning. Planning was probably the wrong word. It implied steps and a process. Hoping was more like it. You don't know anything that's happened to the clan in the last year. Kordax, sitting across from me. No. I don't know anything that's happened anywhere. To anybody. Whoa. He looked at Jace, who cleared his throat. Hang on. First of all, how are you feeling now? Like, are you okay? Wait a minute. He looked at Cord, then back at me. They said there weren't any tigers here. Just wolves. 
What the hell did that mean? I took a deep breath. They wouldn't understand. It's something I'm still trying to get a handle on. Not being a tiger anymore. I don't understand. How is that possible? We don't just randomly change. Cord's eyes widen. Do we? No, we don't, I said, shaking my head. So? They were doing tests on you, Jace murmured, staring at me. Talking more to himself than he was to either of us. They fucked with your DNA. Or whatever it is that makes us who we are. I guess so. Not like they ever told me what they were doing. But it's as good an explanation as any. They were always injecting me with stuff. I looked at them, but threw them at the same time. To the past. I was back in the lab. The lights were so bright. They hurt my eyes. It was cold most of the time. I was almost always cold. Jesus Christ. Cord sounded sick. They wanted to find out if they could change us from one species to another, Jace muttered. He sounded murderous. Well, surprise. They can. Instead of looking sorry for me, Jace said, Where did we go for your 21st birthday? I rolled my eyes. He was testing me. That made sense. I would want to test me too. That awful strip club on the Florida-Georgia border. With those poor tired girls who had to ask for money for the jukebox so they could have something to dance to. He chuckled with a shake of his head. That was such a shitty night. The least sexy experience of my whole life, I decided. His smile faded. Hey. You understand I needed to know. Yeah. I do. I couldn't hold it against him. How come you didn't get in touch with us? Cord acts. Ah. The big question. I was waiting for that one, too. I had to tread carefully. It's been a lot to go through, man. Know what I mean. They gave me so many drugs, obviously. I laughed out loud, surprising myself. Son of a bitch, it never even occurred to me to ask for the date. Not once. And I've been out for two weeks. What's that tell you? I was wondering how you didn't find out until now how long it's been since you went missing, Jace admitted. I understand if it doesn't make sense. Really, I do. When they first broke me out of there, I mean, it wasn't exactly a fun experience first off. It was bloody and nasty. And confusing. I didn't know what was happening, whether the people freeing us were the good guys or just more bad guys. So that took a little time to get over. Being around other people was an adjustment too. I still don't like being too close to anybody for very long. The two of them looked painfully uncomfortable. They hadn't expected to hear me say things like that. It's not like it is in movies, is it? I asked with a grin. Somebody gets rescued from a shitty situation, like they were captive someplace for a long time, and it cuts to them being happy and like, well-adjusted. And normal. But when it happens in real life, nothing turns out that way. It took the first week for me to feel like the drugs were finally out of my system. Shouldn't you see a doctor? Cord acts. I couldn't help shaking my head. Yeah. I'll tell him I was held for a year, in an underground lab, which a bunch of shapeshifters destroyed after slaughtering everybody inside. Oh. Good point. I'm starting to feel much more like myself, I added, which was true. So I'm a dire wolf instead of a tiger now. I can live with that, so long as I don't have to live in that lab anymore. I can't imagine what it must have been like for you, Jace muttered. We never thought you'd end up so far away. Not like we would have known where to look anyway. We never knew about this research experimental group. They didn't advertise online, know what I mean. Yeah, I guess not. Did you hear all about them, down in Florida? It's tough to tell what's a rumor and what's real, Cord said. Believe me, whatever you hear, no matter how crazy it sounds, it's probably true. They were like something out of a science fiction movie. Or a horror flick. It's all over now, Jace reminded me. Even if it doesn't seem like it is, it is. 
You can come home and take your time getting over it, and you can see one of our doctors too. You won't have to make anything up for them. You sure that's okay? Cold fingers squeezed my heart. Are you kidding? Dad will insist, he grinned. Don't tell me you forgot how impossible it is to turn him down. No. I haven't forgotten that. Or how impossible it was to get through to him. Or how unforgiving he was. What a hard ass he could be. He's mellowed now that the war is over, Hort observed. My ears pricked up. What? It's over? Oh shit. I totally forgot. Yeah, it's over, man. It's been over for months. Tell me we won at least. We did, Cord said, pounding his palm on the table. We kicked ass. The East Wings are pretty much a disgusting memory now. I almost didn't dare hope it was true. What about Bradford? Where is he? Dead. Jace's voice didn't leave much room for doubt. He's dead. I couldn't believe it. I had to say it out loud so it would feel real. He was dead. Gone. I didn't have to worry about him anymore. The world spun around me. I couldn't get a hold of any one thought. They all raced through my head so fast. Yeah, you missed a lot of action. We could have used you down there, Cord said. I'm sorry I missed it. Hey, you couldn't help it, Jay said. I wish we could have gotten you out of that place. You're a better man than me, living through that and not going completely insane. Yeah. It wasn't easy. I was barely paying attention to what either of them were saying. He was dead. He couldn't hold anything over my head anymore. I could go home. Couldn't I? Time will take care of everything. Jace grinned as they both stood. Hey. We got an invite to this barbecue tonight. We were supposed to help set up the fire pits. Oh yeah. I'm sure the guys could use your help. I rose too and was surprised when my legs shook. I need to gather some more wood. You want help with that? Cord offered. I waved them off. Their company was what I needed to get away from. I had to think on my own, without them talking in my ears. Bradford was dead. His clan was practically finished. Nobody had to know what I did. I barely paid attention to where my feet landed as I walked deeper into the woods. The thick branches overhead blocked out most of the light. My animal senses made up for the darkness. I might never have stopped walking if I hadn't heard footsteps behind me. Just like that, I whirled around and was a breath away from shifting to attack. Wait, wait. Daniela held up her hands, palm out. I'm not trying to hurt you. I just wanted to check on you. I took a step back and a deep breath. Christ, thanks for freaking me out. I'm not the one who was about to bear fangs, she laughed shakily. I could just about hear her heart pounding and guilt pierce my heart. Sorry. Just one of those things now. I looked around. What's up? What did you want? Like I said, just to check on you. She gestured behind her. You didn't look happy to see those two. I was worried for you. You don't have to worry about me, you know. Says the man who almost jumped out of his skin because he heard me walking behind him. I bristled. All right. But let me know how you react after spending a year in a lab. She gasped over me. A year. I nodded. So they tell me. My God. I know, right? Imagine hearing something like that. Losing a whole year. I don't even know who won the World Series. She snorted. You're talking to the wrong person about that. Sorry. We started walking together, slowly. Like she sensed that I wasn't in a hurry to get back to the rest of them. She was good at that and at calming me down. I didn't feel half as agitated as I had when I first walked into the dark, cool woods. She cleared her throat after a while. I guess you'll be going back with them then. She caught me off guard. I hadn't expected her to bring that up. Or to sound so sad when she did. 
I looked at her of the corner of my eye. I don't know. You don't? She sounded stunned. Maybe happy, even. I don't. Why? I. I don't know, she sputtered. I mean, I figured you would be happy to get back to your own clan. Those two look so happy to see you, it's obvious they care. A whole year went by, but they were still looking for you. True. Did something bad happen back there? You never did tell me why you were traveling. Was it a vacation, or were you just trying to get away from them? Wow. That's a loaded question. She had no idea how uncomfortable it made me, and there was no reason why she should. But somehow, she had a way of reaching into my head and pulling out the things I wanted to hide. Which I'm guessing doesn't have an easy answer, or else you would have told me I was way off base, she murmured. Stop being so smart for a minute. Give a guy a break. I wasn't mad. I wasn't even annoyed. If anything, I wanted to tell her more. I was tired of keeping everything bottled up inside. The pressure would break me if I didn't release it. I would explode from the inside out. You don't have to tell me anything you don't want to tell. You know that, right? She stopped walking and touched my arm. I stopped and turned to her. Yeah. I do. But I have to tell somebody or I'll go nuts. I took a deep breath and hoped I wasn't making a huge mistake. Chapter 6 Daniela I took a deep breath and wished my heart would stop racing. So he trusted me. Big deal. It didn't mean we were getting married or anything. But when he looked at me the way he was and his whole heart was open and exposed, I couldn't help but feel a little thrill. He trusted me with something big. It had to mean something. If it'll make you feel better, you can tell me. I want to help if I can. One corner of his mouth quirked up in a little smile. You sure you're not insanely curious? I mean, I'm sort of building this up pretty big. I hoped it was dark enough that he couldn't see me blushing. Stop kidding around. I'm not like that. No, you're not. He turned serious again. Come on. Let's sit by the lake. It's getting creepy in here. I led the way out into the open, away from the edge of the lake, and sat on an old weathered log. The sunlight had that strange late-day quality that turned everything to copper, and it turned his hair to gold. I could have watched him forever, just standing there at the water's edge with his back to me. Every movement made the sunlight flicker and dance through his golden mane. Promise you'll keep this to yourself, he asked turning his head slightly so I got a look at his full profile, the strong chin and jaw, the straight nose, the smooth brow. Of course. You can't even tell Layla. I won't. He nodded and turned away again. I'm not sure I can go home. Why did my heart skip a beat when he said that? I told myself to get a grip, that I shouldn't be happy over him not wanting to go or being unable to go. It wasn't a good thing for him. I needed to keep his needs in mind, we were friends, and he was hurting or scared, and I should have cared more about that than about my selfish need to keep him around. Why not? I asked when he didn't continue. When I left my clan to travel to Chicago, it wasn't because I wanted to help the clan. I was doing it to help myself. How could you help yourself? I thought he might have meant he was trying to get in good with his boss, kiss a little butt but that wouldn't explain a fear of going back. His shoulders rose and fell as he took a deep breath. I was on a fact-finding mission. For our enemy. My blood went cold. That didn't make sense. It didn't match up with the mental image I had of him at all. I thought he was noble, honest, brave. How naive could I be? Was I still a little girl, reading fairy tales before going to sleep? I didn't know anything about him. I had only wanted to believe I did. You're very quiet, he observed, and his voice was soft. Sad. I don't know what to say, I whispered. I didn't expect you to. I guess this ruins your opinion of me, huh? He turned a little, so he could look at me over his shoulder. His voice. 
it just about broke my heart. He sounded like a little boy who knew he was going to get in trouble and was just waiting for his punishment. I don't understand is all, I said. I had to choose my words carefully. I had earned his trust and I wanted to keep it that way. I'll make it easier for you. His large hands clasped behind his back. The leader of our enemy clan, Bradford, was blackmailing me. He would tell Vincent what he knew if I didn't do what he wanted. He didn't want to spy on his clan, but there was something bad enough in his past that he could be blackmailed. I wasn't sure if this made me feel much better. You were his spy then. You could say that. He wanted to know how many of our members from the Midwest were coming to Florida, what their names were, whether they had any weaknesses, including the names and locations of their mates, if there were any. Oh God! Bile rose in my throat and made me grimace. Obviously, I didn't want to do it. I mean, it was against everything I believed. I might not have known the guys personally, but they were my blood just the same. Hell, even if they weren't, it meant maybe killing them or the people they loved, and I couldn't stand knowing I would get innocent people killed just because he wanted leverage. What did you do? I was breathless, hoping he would say he ran away. I went to Chicago. He shrugged. After several sleepless nights, I knew I didn't have a choice. It was like a punch to the stomach. What did he have on you? I whispered. I wasn't sure I wanted to know, but I had to ask. That's another story. I don't feel comfortable getting into that right now. Sorry. Don't be sorry, I said without thinking about it, more out of reflex than anything else. It's not my business anyway. I never had the chance to tell him anything, by the way. I want you to know that. I never helped him. But, it was because you were kidnapped. Right? He flinched. Yes. Because they kidnapped me. How did it happen? Oldest story in the book, he said, sounding rueful. Almost laughing at himself. I went hunting alone, in an area I wasn't familiar with. When I heard their footsteps, I didn't know where to run to get away. I trapped myself against the side of an old rock wall that was too high to jump. His hands closed into tight fists. I guess they saved me, in a way. I didn't have to sell my soul. He bent down to pick up a few small rocks, which he skimmed along the surface of the otherwise still lake. I watched them bounce, and each bounce created a ripple which collided with the other ripples, until that was all there was, ripples in all directions, spreading as far as the eye could see. I had an entire year to beat myself up over it, he muttered when he was out of rocks. And I did. Every fucking day, I cursed myself for not standing up to him when he gave me that ultimatum. I didn't have to go. I could have shown a little backbone, a little integrity. I could have challenged him to tell the clan what he knew about me. If I had called his bluff, he probably would have gone ahead with it, but at least I could have lived with myself. Maybe. I don't know. But it would have been better than feeling like a traitor, and being locked up because of it. Somebody's living experiment. I deserved everything I got. I had to speak up when I heard that. Listening to him beating up. On himself was too much to sit through without saying something. Don't punish yourself like that. Why not? I deserve it, Daniela. And I'm not trying to get sympathy, honestly, I don't expect you to feel sorry for me. I won't hate you either, if that's what you're trying to get me to do. No, I don't want you to do that either, he murmured softly. I got up from the log and went to him. Look. You did more than pay the price for taking that trip. And maybe that was the price you had to pay. I don't know. I don't guide the universe or anything like that. Ask Layla about that sort of thing. It's not my specialty. But I'll tell you this, you're a good person. I can feel it, and I'm very good at reading people. That ass had you in a corner and he used you. He sounds like a terrible person. Evil, really? He was. He's dead now. Good. He deserved whatever happened to him. I couldn't believe how worked up I was, 
heart pounding, breathing heavy, blood pumping so fast it made my head hurt. I wanted to bring the bastard back to life so I could kill him myself. When I imagined Grant cornered in pain, unable to sleep because he couldn't figure out what to do, tied down to a metal cot with a line in his arm, getting pumped full of drugs that changed who he was. I couldn't help myself. I reached up, turned his face to mine with both hands and stood on tiptoe so I could brush my lips against his. It was a gentle, tentative kiss, and I was scared to death that he would push me away, but I couldn't help myself. I had to show him that I understood what he did and that I didn't judge him for it. He didn't pull away. Instead, he slid his arms around my waist and pulled me in until my body was pressed against his. The rapid beat of his heart matched mine as my arms closed around his neck. I couldn't believe it, it wasn't all in my head. He wanted me to. Or at least, he needed the little bit of comfort I was able to give him in that moment. It would have to be enough. I ran my fingers through his hair and heard the soft groan in the back of his throat as our mouths moved over each other. When his tongue slid along my lips, a shudder ran through me and I melted against him. It ended much too soon. He pulled away, not totally, but enough so that the kiss ended. My head spun. I leaned against him, my forehead to his shoulder. I'm sorry, he whispered between gasps for air. You don't have to be, I whispered back. I started it. Yeah, but I shouldn't have let you. I know you're just trying to make me feel better. I looked up at him. His eyes seemed even darker than usual. Like the shade of blue the sky turned to just before it got dark. I grimaced. No. That's not it. Don't you know how much I've been wanting to do that? Or do you think I tag along in the dark after every shifter I meet? He snorted gently, grinning. Even though you know what I did. I know you had your reasons, whatever they were. I hated to think of what would be bad enough for him to betray his clan or even consider doing it, but that wasn't my place. He would tell me when the time came, and we could deal with it then. For the time being, I was still in his arms and everything I didn't even know I wanted was coming true. And I wouldn't ruin it. I rested one hand on his chest and felt the sure steady beat underneath my palm. I trust this. I believe this is good. His eyes searched my face. Are you even real? You're the one with his arms around me. What do you think? They tightened ever so slightly, and I smiled just before he lowered his head again. Footsteps crashing through the woods broke the magic of the moment, and he let me go just before Layla broke through the line of trees. There you are. Jace said something about you bringing wood for the fire pit. I was scared to death when you didn't come back. I glared at her with my hands on my hips. So you came looking for him all by yourself? Not a smart move, lady. Oh. Yeah. I guess you're right. She blushed as he walked past on his way to gather wood. I saw right through her, but waited until he was out of earshot. You are such a little sneak. I hissed. She blushed harder and bit hard on her bottom lip. What do you mean? I mean you're a terrible liar, for one thing, and I know you wanted to see what we were doing. She shrugged. Hey, I didn't see anything. She reached for me, and the thumb she swiped over my cheek came back pink and shiny. Your lip gloss is smeared, by the way. And the twigs and branches Grant picks up won't be the only wood he's carrying. Just saying. I think it'll take a minute for him to, ah, uh, calm down. It was my turn to blush furiously, even though I couldn't help giggling a little, no matter how hard I tried not to. I was too damn happy to hold it in. Her laugh rang out. Don't worry. Your secret's safe with me. She took me by the hand and led me back to camp while my mind spun, and I wondered what would have happened if she didn't interrupt us. Chapter 7 Grant I couldn't stop watching Daniela. Whenever she moved, no matter what she was doing, my eyes wanted to follow her and memorize everything. The way she smiled. The way her hair swayed when she shook her head, showing off the colors underneath the top layer of blonde. Everything about her was special. Even the way her tongue darted out 
to lick a little bit of sauce off the corner of her mouth. Lust uncoiled deep inside my core, and I didn't realize I had unconsciously licked my lips until I tasted the little bit of sauce left on them from the meat I had just eaten. Her eyes found mine like she felt me watching, and she smiled before ducking her head. Shy, maybe a little flirtatious. I imagined throwing her over my shoulder and charging into my tent with her. Not letting her leave until the sun came up, doing all sorts of things to her. So, what do you think? Jace Axe, snapping me to attention. God damn it, I hadn't heard a word he said. Home. He looked across the fire pit to the other side, where Daniela chatted with Layla and another one of the girls. A familiar, knowing smile spread across his face. Ah. Okay. I get it. You don't get shit, I muttered, punching his shoulder lightly. Right. I guess not. He rolled his eyes, but let it go. I was asking, when you want to get rolling out of here? Do you want to fly back with us? Our flight's scheduled for tomorrow, we could probably get you on it. Just like that, my heart felt like a lead block. That soon? Hey, it's up to you, he said. I understand if you have a business you need to take care of here. He tilted his head in Daniela's direction. But I do think you should get a move on, too. The sooner you get to a doctor, the easier I'll sleep at night. I know Dad will feel the same. Yeah. Your dad? I called him earlier, he said, totally missing the dead sound of my voice. He was too busy being excited. He's fucking over the moon happy that you're here, and you're, well, in mostly good shape. As good as can be expected. Better, even. Thanks for all the compliments. I don't know what to say, I forced a smile. You know what I mean. Anyway, he wants to throw a party for you when you get back. Everybody's gonna want to see you, talk to you, find out what happened. Oh no. I held my head in my hands. Not that. Ah. I see what you mean. Okay, we'll set a rule, no asking about what happened. They'll just have to accept that you're back and be glad. No need to dredge up the specifics of what happened. Sound fair? More than fair, I admitted, even though I still hated the idea. A party. For me. The person who least deserved one. But none of them knew that, of course. They didn't know how close I had come to betraying all of them. Especially Vincent. What would he say if he knew why I left Florida? Cord called Jace over. He was talking with Lance and some of the other guys about the clans and how they were set up. I wondered if Lance was thinking about joining up, or even starting his own clan. It made sense, seeing as how the pack was so scattered and unsure. Being part of a clan meant being part of a family, and always knowing someone had your back. Unless they decided to stab you in it. Just like that my mood tanked. I backed away from the group who were still enjoying their roasted meat and the beer a few of the group's members had picked up from a store down the road and moved in the direction of my tent. I had to get away again. I wondered if that was how the party Vincent wanted to throw would go. I'd show up, hang around for a few minutes, then run away. You all right? One of the guys slung an arm over my shoulder. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Being around a lot of people is still hard right now. Thanks to Jason Cord and the grapevine of gossip, they all knew it had been a year since I was kidnapped. A year spent locked up in what amounted to solitary confinement. His face showed his sympathy. Understood, brother. I'll tell anybody looking for you that you needed time to yourself. I nodded and smiled, grateful, then fled to my tent. The panic started spreading through my chest just the way it had when I first saw Jason Cord coming out of the cabin. Panic, and the surety that I would fuck something up somehow. Bradford was dead, but my secret wasn't. How was I supposed to live with myself when Vincent was all set to treat me like the returning hero? It would be hard enough seeing him again without the entire clan around us, wishing me well, telling me how glad they were that I had survived. Grateful to have me back. When I had been so close to hurting them. Grant? 
Daniela's soft whisper filtered through the mesh window of the tent. I saw her standing out there, arms wrapped around her body. She was unsure of herself. Probably wondering, should she bother me? Yeah, I murmured. I'm in here. Are you all right? Do you need anything? Yes. I needed a lot of things. I needed absolution and the ability to forgive myself. I needed to forget. I needed to believe that going home was the right thing to do. I couldn't run away forever. The longer I stayed away, the more obvious it would seem that I was hiding something. I could only get away with blaming it on PTSD or whatever for so long. Can I come in? She whispered when I didn't answer her question. Yeah. Sure. She walked around to the front of the tent and unzipped it, then zipped it shut once she was inside. The top of the tent was high enough that she didn't have to stoop down. I got worried when I saw you leave, she said, sitting cross-legged on the ground. I wanted to warn her against getting her dress dirty, but reminded myself that she had been living virtually outdoors for years. How she managed to look so perfect all the time, I would never understand. There was too much happening. Too many voices. Too much pressure from Jace. He wants you to go home, she observed in a low, sorrowful voice. Or maybe I was only imagining the sorrow. I could hardly believe she wanted me to stay, even if she had kissed me like she wanted me to. Yeah. As soon as possible. The whole clan wants me there, including Vincent. I snorted, shaking my head. He wants to throw me a party. I mean, am I in hell or what? What's so bad about a party? I sighed. You know. Okay, so you feel guilty. That's understandable. But you don't need to. Not now. You didn't go through with it. But I would have. Don't you see? I was ready to do it. I went to Chicago with the intention of doing it. If I had just had one more day, I would have gotten in touch with Bradford and told him everything he wanted to know. I tapped my finger against my chest. That's in here. You know, that heart you believe in so much. I'm carrying that in here, and I can't let myself off the hook that easily. Because you're a good person. I knew you were a good person. I threw my hands into the air. I give up. I can't make you understand. Her eyes narrowed. No. I can't make you understand that beating yourself up is getting you nowhere. She rose to her knees, then walked to me on them. You're dead set on punishing yourself when you've already received all the punishment you deserve and more. I mean, you're pretty much set for life at this point. All your future bad deeds are already taken care of after what you went through. I chuckled. She took my face in her hands, and her eyes burned with a light I had never seen before, like she was still looking into the flames of the fire pit, though we were nowhere near it. It's over. Let it go. Get rid of it. You can't hold on to guilt forever. I'm giving you permission to move on. Even though I knew it was ridiculous, her words touched my heart and lightened the heavy weight of it. I had been walking around with that weight dragging me down for weeks, even longer than that, before the kidnapping, the entire way to Chicago and throughout my stay there. For the first time since my meeting with Bradford, I felt good. What if Vincent finds out? I ask. I don't know Vincent, but I can guess the sort of man he is if he's leader of an entire clan. Even so, why would he find out? Bradford's dead and his clan is practically dissolved. They lost the war. Let the secret go with them. He never needs to find out. You know what you did was probably the wrong thing, even if you had the right reasons. And you never had the chance to tell Bradford what you found out. In the end, you didn't do anything wrong. He won't see it that way. He'll never know. Stop worrying about things that haven't happened, that will never happen. There's so much more to think about. My hands found her waist. She was still touching my face. Like what? Like the future. Like the fact that I'm kneeling here in front of you, and we're alone. She crept closer. 
like the way I felt you watching me out there. I like that. You did? My hand slid around to her back. You didn't think I was creepy? No. Unless maybe I did, but I like creepy guys. I never thought about it that way. We both laughed quietly, trying to keep our voices down. Not like anybody would have heard us. The party was going strong. I wondered if Jace and Corb would be in any condition to catch their flight by the time morning came. I kissed her forehead, the tip of her nose. If you like creepers, I'll be a creeper. If you like guys who wear capes and tights, I'll wear them. I grimaced at the idea of tights. Whoever you want, I'll be. She gave me a smile, sighed just before our mouths met again. This time, there wasn't anything or anyone to stop us. I wrapped my arms around her and pulled her close, pressing my body to hers. She was so warm, so real. Like she came alive under my hands. The way she groaned into my mouth made me wonder at who was under that sweet, beautiful exterior. The wolf was right there under the surface, and the wolf in me responded hungrily. I have to confess something, I whispered between kisses, running my hands over her back, then down until I cupped her ass. It was just as full and firm as it looked, and I let my fingers sink into it. She released a low whimper. What is it? She breathed, kissing my neck, my jaw, running her fingers through my hair. Bolts of electricity raced through me, and I held her even closer, pressing my cock against her. I don't know how I'll react. I mean, now that I'm different. I pulled away enough to look her in the eye. Hers were half-closed, and she breathed heavily through her open mouth. Her hand slid over my shoulders, then down my arms. I'll take my chances. Are you sure? What do you think? One of her hands cupped my already painfully erect cock. And I think you want to find out what'll happen. Don't you? Yes. I covered her mouth again and thrust my tongue inside as we found our way to the ground. My hand moved up her leg, which wound around my hip. She groaned, flexing her hips up to meet me, and I stroked the silky skin of her thigh, then the soft curve of her ass. Her desperate groan made me even harder than before, and the way she tightened her leg around me made the wolf howl deep inside. I could smell her need, coming at me in waves all centered between her legs. I flexed my hips, driving my cock against her, and we both groaned. More, she whispered as she pulled the t-shirt over my head and ran her hands over my back. More, more, please. Her head rolled back and forth, her breath coming out in sharp little gasps the further down her perfect body my mouth traveled. I slid the straps of her dress over her shoulders and kissed her flawless flesh, then worked the dress down over her tits. They were perfect too, with pert little nipples begging to feel my lips close around them. I sucked one, then the other, tasting her sweetness and listening to the way she whimpered and sighed. Her body was like a wave under me, rolling and writhing. I could barely hold on to her. It was like riding a bull. What do you want? I groaned, kissing her stomach, working the dress over her hips and down her legs. You. I want you. She lifted her hips so I could peel off her panties. I ran my hands from ankle to thigh, wanting to always remember the smoothness of her skin, the smell of her arousal as it mixed with the scent of her skin and hair. I lapped at the even softer skin between her thighs, before letting my tongue slide between her swollen lips. Yes, she gasped, lifting her hips, riding my face until she came with a shuddering cry that sent shivers all through me and made me harder than a rock. The wolf in me panted and snarled, and I wanted more, more, until I got everything it craved. I need you, I groaned, lowering my body over hers and grinding against her. My shorts were still in the way, but not for long. She slid them over my hips, stroking my ass the way I had stroked hers, then down my legs. She was so hot and slick, and I slid inside her tight heel without effort. She rode me as I rode her, hard, desperately hard, breathless and straining and wild. I told myself to be careful, to not hurt her, but that was just a small voice in the back of my head. The rest of me wanted her harder, wanted to ride her until I broke her, and she told me she would be mine forever. Because she was. She was mine and always would be. Nobody else's.
and when she jerked her hips up in time with my thrusts and dragged her nails across my shoulders and down my back as she whispered my name again and again, I growled in response. Growled and thrust even harder. So good, yes. She tightened, clenching down all around me, and I thrust one more time as hard as I could before the wave crashed over both of us. I collapsed on top of her, and we held each other for what felt like years, decades and eternity. The world moved around us, I could still hear voices outside the tent down the path, but we stayed completely still. I couldn't go anywhere without her. Not after this. I would never find the same pleasure or pride or triumph with any other woman. I would never forget the taste of her skin, the way she kissed me, or the sound of her voice as she whispered my name. You okay? I asked, breathing heavy against her neck. I felt her pulse racing under my mouth and kissed the spot where it throbbed hardest. My back and shoulders stung where she had marked me, like she had claimed me as her own, the way I had claimed her. I've been less okay, she giggled. What do you think? And it wasn't too. I don't know, too much? I pushed up so I could look into her eyes, and she smiled as she shook her head. No. Not at all. She stroked my cheek. I'm a wolf too. Remember? Right. Of course. I rolled onto my back with a heavy sigh. You drained me. If the tent caught fire, I don't think I could make it out. Her laugh was like the tinkling of bells. Like music. You don't have to flatter me. You already got in my panties. I laughed too. God, you're tough. She leaned on my chest with a smug little look, and I ran a hand over her hair. I had never felt so good, so right. I wanted the feeling to last forever. What if it could? An idea started forming deep in my brain. Would she? No, not so soon. It would be crazy, stupid, reckless, and thoughtless. And if she broke my heart, I would deserve it for being an idiot. But I couldn't stop thinking about it once the idea took root. This is going to sound ridiculous, I murmured. Try me. I thought I already did. She slapped at my chest but giggled. Be serious. Okay. Serious. My heart just about exploded, it pounded so hard. She must have felt it under her head, but she didn't let on. I was almost sure she would think it was crazy, but I couldn't help it. I know we barely know each other. I know it's only been a couple of weeks. But I wondered if you would come to Florida with me. You know, for good. Chapter 8 Daniela I don't know what to do. I looked up at my best friend. What should I do? She chuckled, spreading her arms as she shrugged. I can't tell you what to do. You know that. Yeah. I know. I wish you could though. And you would hate me if I did. You know you would. Hate's a pretty strong word. I chewed my lip, as anxiety swelled up in my chest again. Hey. What's the big deal? So he asked you to go to Florida with him. I mean Florida's not exactly my ideal choice, bugs, humidity, whatever, but life could be a lot worse. Right? Yeah, of course. She sat next to me on the bed. What's really the problem then? I shook my head. There was too much happening in there, to make sense of all of it. Too soon I guess. Doesn't it feel too soon? Hey. Don't look at me for advice on that. It took me and Lance years to finally admit we had feelings for each other. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Shouldn't it take longer than this? I could see if we knew each other better, or even if he wanted to start sharing a tent or a cabin here with the rest of us. But asking me to go all the way to Florida when I've only known him for two weeks. Calm down. Breathe. She put a hand on my back and took several deep breaths with me. She was right. I was losing it. I had to get my head back on straight. Remember, he told you there was no reason to leave right away. He's not even sure if he wants to yet. Right? Right? You'll have a little more time to think things through and get to know him better. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. 
She snickered. Trust me. I know how that feels. I cringed. How can you even joke about that? She shrugged it off. It's easier to joke about it than think too hard about it. Besides, if I make a joke, it's easier to deal with. I didn't know how she managed that. If a psycho held a gun to my temple, I wouldn't be cracking jokes over it weeks later. I'm not sure I would know what to do down there. I mean if things don't work out for us. I chewed my lip until it felt raw, then started attacking my thumbnail. Layla gently removed my finger from between my teeth and held my hand in hers. Listen. Really listen. You're a capable, smart person. I know you said you didn't like school or do all that great in it, but that doesn't mean you're not smart or that you don't know how to take care of yourself. That's true. I can take care of myself. I didn't believe it, but I knew it was what she wanted me to say. You'll do more than fine no matter what happens. If things don't work out well. She shrugged with a sad frown. That happens sometimes. You can always come back to us. Or you could start a new life for yourself someplace else. But either way, you'll be able to find something to do, some way to support yourself and start your own life. I mean, doesn't that sound good? A life of your own. I had to smile when I remembered all the times I had daydreamed about my own life. Not having to live on the run, not having to look over my shoulder. A life where I could be who I was without having to hide. Ideally with other people like me, where none of us judged each other. Grant had already told me about life in his clan, how the shifters coexisted with humans. Nothing was perfect, but they were civil with each other and accepted each other's presence for the most part. Yeah. That does sound good, I admitted. You could still join the Everglades if you wanted and just go live someplace else. They have splinter groups all over the place, right? I heard they're really big, especially on the East Coast. I've always imagined myself living in the big city, I admitted with a shy smile. It feels weird saying that out loud. She tipped her head back and laughed. Why, she asks. Because none of those dreams ever felt real. You know? Like, what's the point of admitting to yourself or anybody else that you want something more when there's absolutely zero chance you'll ever get it? So you learn to tell yourself over and over that certain things aren't meant to happen, that just because we want something doesn't mean we're meant to have it. And after a while, sometimes a long, long time, you start to believe it. And it doesn't hurt so much anymore. She wasn't laughing anymore. Tears stood out in her eyes as she pulled me into a hug. Oh, sweetie. I didn't know you felt that way. Why didn't you ever tell me? It's not the sort of thing you share with other people, I admitted. Now it's different. We're on the other side. But back then? It was all real back then. I mean, we shared a tent, and you never told me what was really in your heart. She pulled away and brushed her fingers over her cheeks. I wish you could have trusted me with that. It's a heavy load to carry. I didn't mean to make you cry, I murmured. Please. Everything makes me cry right now. I found a cricket inside the cabin last night and stepped on it, then bawled my eyes out for an hour because I had killed a freaking cricket. I mean come on. We giggled together, and I felt lighter than I had in a long time. I didn't have to tell myself anymore that certain dreams weren't meant to come true. It was too much to believe, but it was true. Maybe I would start believing it one day. I'll miss this if I go, I pointed out. You and me. Her face fell. Yeah. Me too. Oh geez, don't start bawling your eyes out on me. I won't know what to do. I'll probably start crying too. She nodded hard and fast and I could tell she was trying to control herself. Her chin wobbled but then stopped. I'll be fine, she breathed. I nodded. Then, Florida? I asked cringing. What the heck is down there? Humidity. Bugs. Snakes. Hurricanes. I heard they're right outside Miami, she offered. Miami's supposed to be pretty great. And there's palm trees and great weather and beaches. A beach I won't have to live on, I smiled. Exactly. 
she took my hands again and squeezed. You know, you're talking about this like it's really going to happen. You sound like you know what you're going to decide. I winced, glancing out the window. It's still so early in the morning. I don't know if he's even up yet. I've given this almost no time to think over. You can think about it all you want, you know. You can try to talk yourself out of it too. But when push comes to shove, you know in your heart what the right choice is. She leaned in, whispering, Imagine him leaving today with Jason Cord. You'll never see him again. What do you think you would have wished you'd done different? I closed my eyes and imagined him kissing me goodbye. The pain in my chest was enough to make my eyes fly open again. I wish I would have gone with him, I said, odd. There you go, my friend. Her chin wobbled dangerously hard. God, I'm gonna miss you so much. Oh my lord. I grabbed her and held her tight as we both lost it. I'll miss being here while you're pregnant. And I won't be here when the baby's born. We cried even harder. We don't have to leave right away, I sobbed into her shoulder. But you will and that's okay, she wept. I want you to be happy. That's all that matters. I hate this, I admitted. Sobs shook me until my shoulders and back were sore and I had hiccups. Once we were finished, we stretched out on our backs across the foot of the bed. Every once in a while, one of us would let out a little shudder or gasp, but most of the emotion was gone. It feels like everything changed so fast, she marveled as we both stared up at the ceiling. One day it was the three of us and the group, going from place to place, and we had each other's backs through everything. Now? I'm pregnant, Nia's in Montana, and you're going to Florida. And we're all happy, that's important to remember when we miss each other. You're happy. Nia's happy. The jury's still out on me. You'll be happy, she promised, turning her head to look at me with a knowing grin. I've been watching you two, and you'll be happy. You're like two peas in a pod. You were meant for each other. I guess one good thing came out of that nightmare at the lab. I guess so, I whispered. I hated thinking that I was finally happy thanks to his imprisonment. I guess it was fate. Oh, I'm sure something's out there guiding all of us. It guided you two together. You didn't have one of those, what do you call them, meat cutes, but you met anyway. And now, something happy can come out of all that horrible stuff he went through. That's worth it, right? You're right. You're always right. Sometimes it's annoying, I giggled. It's easy to be right when you're not talking about yourself. Remember, I'm the one who was three months pregnant when I decided to go on a secret mission in Washington, remember? Roughing it the way we did, hiking all those miles when I felt for sure that I was spew chunks all over the place. Oh gross, I laughed. And getting my silly ass caught. Not the queen of good decision-making, my friend, but thanks for flattering me anyway. She sat up with a groan. I have packing to do. And I think there's a man out there, just waiting to know whether you're coming home with him. My heart skipped a beat, and I wondered how it was possible to feel so low, so dejected and so completely joyful all at once. It was such an easy decision, when Layla put it the way she'd put it. Of course, I would go to Florida and be happy with Grant. No other choice made sense. We belonged together. I gave her one more hug, before hurrying out of the cabin. The rest of the camp was up at that point, walking past, waving good morning. They were excited about moving out soon, and I was glad for them. I hoped they would all find happiness the way the girls and I had. I jogged over to Grant's tent and whistled the whole way. Not much of a chance that he would still be in there, but I wanted to check there first. Grant? I asked when I reached the tent. No answer, but I did hear a sound from behind the tent. Scratching. Twig snapping. Grant? I ax again, raising my voice. I. Peeked around the side. Walking around to the back seemed like it might be a bad idea. Dark brown fur. Grant's fur was a beautiful golden color, like his hair. Who's there? I ax my head whipping back and forth, trying to find somebody. Where had they all disappeared to? I heard voices coming from the lake, 
drifting over to me through the trees. I sniffed the air. No blood. Another sound, louder than ever, and the tent shook back and forth. That shocked me into action, and without a thought I shifted. The sound of shredding fabric filled my ears before I roared and sprang around to the side of the tent. My breaths came in heavy gasps as I snarled and growled. Who was there? Who would dare? A full-grown brown bear stood on its hind legs and stared down at me. No. Not a bear. It didn't smell like a real bear. I felt its intelligence. Who are you? I axed silently, glaring at it with my hackles up. I was ready to pounce the second it made a wrong move. I thought about Jace and Cord, making sure their images were clear in my mind so he would see them. Are you one of them? I axed. He didn't think anything clearly enough for me to feel it. All he did was stare at me with those eyes. Red eyes. Crazy? No, I didn't sense that. Just silent. Sizing me up. Get out of here, I thought with all my might. You're not wanted here. Go. The others will come. Many others. Out. Now. I could have sworn he smiled at me before turning and ambling away, crashing through the trees. I waited until the darkness swallowed him up, before taking a deep breath and relaxing a little. Hey. I turned around in time to see Grant walking up with Jace and Cord. I started shaking all over, and didn't stop even when they reached me. Chapter 9 Grant I don't like this. Cord examined the back of the tent again. Whoever it was, they were trying to tear through the canvas. Lovely, I growled. Daniela hadn't spoken a word since she told us what happened just before we got back from our hunt. I had wrapped her in a sheet when she shifted back, for modesty's sake. Her ruined clothes were in a heap by her feet. They were trying to get in here. But why? And why couldn't they have done it in human form? Jace asked. Maybe they were afraid of being recognized. Cord looked back at us from where he was crouched near the ground. By whom? Daniela looked up at us with wide eyes. We don't know any bear shifters, as far as I know. Sure you do, Cord grinned. She smiled faintly, looking a little sick. You know what I mean. Anyone besides you. Maybe it was us he was trying to avoid, Jace muttered, shaking his head. I can't imagine who that would be, though. My heart stopped for a moment before it took off at double time. What were the chances? I exchanged looks with Daniela. What are the odds of a random shifter wandering into camp? Cord acts. Maybe it was looking for one of its own, too, Jace wondered. But that wouldn't explain the damage to the tent. He looked at Daniela with his lips pursed. He was thinking, doubting. I knew he was wondering about her. Was she telling the truth? Was she just panicked and didn't actually see what she reported? What he didn't know about her was how good she was at reading other people. She looked him straight in the eye. You know what, maybe it was just a regular old bear. I could be wrong, it wouldn't be the first time, she said, shrugging. You said you could tell it wasn't, though, Cord reminded her with one eyebrow raised. Yeah, I know, but like I said, I might have freaked out too fast. It didn't think anything, like I said. She tapped the side of her head with one finger. I mean, that's sort of a giveaway right there, right? He wasn't like us. Or it was just deliberately hiding its thoughts, Jace murmured. Yeah, I guess that's possible, but I don't know. It doesn't seem likely. Much more likely that a bear wandered into camp. I'm sure it happens all the time. She didn't try too hard to change their minds or ease their questions. I appreciated that. Her smile wasn't too bright, her voice wasn't forced or strained. The two Everglades exchanged looks. Maybe we should hang around for another day or two, make sure everything's all right here, Cord suggested. I didn't know whether or not I liked the idea. Part of me wanted them gone, wanted the source of my guilt as far away as possible. I kept checking on myself, making sure I didn't slip up. It would be hard enough in Florida. 
I didn't need it just then. I don't think you need to. There are so many of us. It's not like some random bear is going to rip us to shreds, Daniela smiled. But if it makes you feel better, I know the rest of the group would love it if you hung around for a while. Lance couldn't stop asking you both questions last night. There's probably a ton more he wants to know, she added. Oh. That's true. They exchanged another look. What was Daniela playing at? Her face didn't give anything away. All right. I'll call the travel agent and see if we can shuffle things around. We should get back to the motel, too, and see if we can extend our reservation. Jay smiled at the two of us before leaving, and Cord followed him. I watched carefully as they walked away, down the path to one of the parking areas. Only when I heard the sound of a car's engine turning over did I feel safe enough to speak. What the hell was that about? I asked, turning to look at Daniela. She fell onto the cot with a heavy sigh. What was I supposed to do? What could either of us do? If we told them to go, they would know something fishy was up. We don't even know if anything fishy's up, I reminded her. You're sure about that? She raised one eyebrow, looking up at me from where she was lying on her back, still wrapped up. You look like you're about ready to jump out of your skin. I'm fine. You're such a liar. I growled when what I really wanted to do was tear the tent down and maybe knock a few trees down while I was at it. You made it up, didn't you? When you said you thought you could be wrong about the bear being one of us. Of course I did. Because you looked so worried. She rolled onto her side and leaned on one elbow. You think it was one of them, don't you? That other clan. Are you psychic? I really want to know, because it seems like you read people too easily. Does it freak you out? She asked with a wink. Maybe a little. She shook her head, making her rainbow hair flow behind her. Not that I know of. And don't change the subject. You think they were in bare form, so you wouldn't recognize them. Who was it? I honestly don't know. I sat on the edge of the cot with my head in my hands. Honestly, not a clue. If the East Wings were really defeated, why would one of them come here? I didn't think there were hardly any of them still around, from the way Jason Cord made it sound. Maybe it wasn't even one of them, she said. Maybe it was another Everglade. I wouldn't know a Everglade if I tripped over one. Could be, but they would still announce themselves. I shook my head. I don't know, Daniela. I don't like it, though. Come here. She held her arms out. The stubborn part of me, a very big part, wanted to refuse her. Push her away. Tell her there were other things on my mind. So why did I go to her? Why did I let her wrap her arms around me? Why did I take her face in my hands and cover her mouth with mine? I needed to forget, at least for a little while. I wanted to let go of the guilt I had been struggling under for so long. I wanted to feel normal for the first time in so long. When I was with her, holding her warm soft body close to mine, I could forget for a little while. She gave me that. She gave me so much more than that. She returned my kisses, eager but tender. Looking into my eyes between kisses, stroking the back of my neck, running her fingers through my hair before letting them dance over the buttons of my shirt. She unbuttoned me without looking, then spread the shirt open and kissed a slow, gentle trail down my chest over my abs. I groaned eyes closed. Every inch she traveled, lower and lower, made it harder for me not to groan loud enough for the whole camp to hear. She was getting closer to the growing, thickening cock under my belt, and I lifted my hips a little, inviting her without meaning to. My body had a mind of its own. Her hand slid over that bulge. I let my head fall back between my shoulder blades, absorbing the sensation of her tongue swirling just above the waistband of my shorts. Damn. I muttered, running my fingers through her hair, moving it to the side so I could look down at what she was doing. Her fingers traced the lines of my cock against the khaki. I strained and twitched and went harder than ever. I thought I would break the zipper by the time she was finished teasing me. 
She stopped teasing finally and worked at the belt, then opened my shorts. She couldn't have unzipped them fast enough. I raised my hips to let her slide them off. She pressed my shoulders back, ordering me to lie down. I stretched out on the cot while she knelt in front of me, then wrapped her fingers around my aching cock. Yeah. I whispered when her tongue slid around the head. Put it in your mouth. She closed her lips around me and plunged down until she reached the base. I thought I might lose my mind. I couldn't remember the last time a woman had me in her mouth. It was better than I remembered. I focused on holding on so it could last as long as possible. It was too good to end too fast. She dragged her tongue along the underside of the shaft, pressing a little harder on each upstroke. I opened my eyes and looked down at her. She was looking up at me with so much lust in her eyes, I almost lost it. Like there was nothing she wanted more in that moment than to suck on my cock. My eyes closed again as everything built to a peak, and I couldn't hold it off anymore. I didn't want to. I wanted to come. Oh God. I grunted, gritting my teeth against anything else that might get attention. She ran her hands over my chest and practically purred. Knowing that she liked doing it pushed me over the edge, and I let go. Fireworks went off behind my eyelids and I sank down on the cot. Um, she murmured, still running her hands all over me. Slowly, gently, easing me back down. It was perfect the way I didn't even know I wanted it to be until just then. Hardly the first blowjob I had ever gotten, and not the most skillful, but the best because she was into it and cared whether or not I felt good. Where the hell did girls like her come from, and how had I missed out for so long? That thought made me sit up and take her by the arms. She opened her eyes wide, surprised, as I lowered her to the ground. There was a sleeping bag there, and I laid her down before sliding out of my shirt. She sighed, arching her back as I lowered myself over her to kiss her neck, her chest, and more. What's this? She whispered, writhing a little, groaning in the back of her throat. That groan turned to a gasp when she felt my hand sliding up over her ass. I always like to return a favor, I whispered, then went back to work. Chapter 10 Grant I opened the tent as slowly and quietly as I could, watching her over my shoulder. She never flinched and her breathing pattern never changed, tiny little snores filled the quiet. I was glad for those little snores just then. They gave me more confidence as I left the tent. A handful of the others were playing basketball at one end of our section of the camp, and another handful were throwing horseshoes. I waved as I walked around to the back of the tent. The paw prints were big and deep. A good-sized bear must have made them. I shuddered when I imagined Daniela facing down an animal of that size. She was brave and maybe a little too headstrong. She would do something stupid like try to attack it. I just knew she would. Should I shift? I couldn't decide. My senses were sharper when I did, but I couldn't have a conversation that way and I didn't feel like standing naked in front of anybody, either. But if I wanted to track, I would have to. I took off my clothes behind the tent, where nobody could see, and let the change flow through me. It was so weird. How long would it take to get used to being a dire wolf, instead of a tiger? I had been a tiger all my life. Mom used to laugh at my cat's reflexes. I didn't have those reflexes anymore. Just another thing those bastards took from me, to go with an entire missing year of my life. I saw more as a wolf, though. My vision stretched further. I could see deep into the dark woods, much deeper than before. I could pick up scents more easily. And I was larger, even though I made a pretty big cat. I wonder if that was all because of what they did to me at that laboratory. If that made my senses so much better. I looked back and forth, scanning slowly. I touched my nose to the ground, closing my eyes to concentrate on the scent of the bear. Where did he go? I let my instincts take over as I trotted out into the woods. The scent grew stronger little by little. There was a broken sapling in my path. He must have knocked it down in his hurry to get away from the camp. I jumped over it and kept moving faster. 
He had hung a left just before stepping out into the clearing around the lake. There had been dozens of people out there. He clearly had wanted to stay hidden. I sniffed the ground to confirm that I was moving in the right direction. I lost him at one point and had to double back and find where he changed course. Pretty soon, I was so deep in the woods I could hardly see in front of me. I was at a loss. I knew you would try to find me. I jumped at the sound of his voice. No wonder I had lost the trail. He had shifted back already. We stood at an overhang, which he had been using as a den. He stepped out of the inky blackness and lifted a lantern to show me his face. I thought I might recognize the long, thin features, the reddish-brown eyes. I couldn't talk to him as a wolf, so I shifted back. So what if I wasn't wearing clothes? He had tried to sneak into my tent. I rose to my feet, never taking my eyes off him. Who are you? What are you doing here? You don't remember me. I'm afraid I don't, I admitted. You saw me that night. At Bradford's office. I was the one who let you in, escorted you back to him. Guarded the door, to make sure you didn't try to break and run. He laughed, a high-pitched almost crazy laugh. What are you doing all the way out here? I asked, looking around, suddenly wondering if he had brought himself some backup. I hadn't smelled more than one of them, but they might not have shifted yet. They could have been waiting for me in the darkness. I kept my guard up. Relax, heartthrob. That's what Bradford used to call you. It was your code name. Heartthrob, because he could tell you thought you were hot shit. He laughed again, and there was more craziness in it. I had the feeling you were one of them, I said, fists clenched. And smart too, he murmured. What do you want? Didn't we wipe your clan out? Are you here to make sure we finish the job? I ax. We? Oh, you mean those two Everglade assholes? They're leaving soon. I'm not worried about them. Some instinct told me to keep my mouth shut about them staying around. If he thought they were leaving, he would be more likely to make a mistake. What do you actually want? I ax again. Why would you come all this way when your clan is virtually non-existent? I came to get my information, he hissed. My stomach flipped. Your what? Information. The information you were supposed to deliver to my boss a year ago. You're crazy, I whispered. That's all over. He's dead, they told me so. I was kidnapped. You must have heard. I heard. How do you think I ended up here, he asks. As for my boss being dead, you're right about that too. But the clan's not dead. They got absorbed into your clan. Right, right, the guys told me all about that. So what is this then? Why would you come for the information? Because, smart guy, you made a deal. If you delivered what you promised, nobody needed to know what you did. Remember what you did. Remember what Bradford found out about you. I forced myself to take a deep breath to keep myself calm. What difference does it make now that there's peace? Let's just say, there's more than a few of us who never agreed with the consolidation of the clans, but we had to go along or else face getting kicked out. Nobody wants to go rogue. It's dangerous. True. I want you to give me the info you collected. I don't have it anymore. I said, shaking my head. Kidnapping, remember. You weren't in human form when they took you, smart guy. Don't think I don't know how it went down. I did my homework, and I've been listening in on some of your conversations. Like the one you had at the picnic table yesterday. And the one you had in your tent last night. He snorted. Cape and tights? Is that the best you could come up with? But she was already in the bag. So I guess you didn't have to try too hard. Shut up, I snarled. He didn't back down. If anything, he seemed pleased that he was getting under my skin. His nasty smile widened. I know your clan went to the hotel you were staying at and claimed your stuff. I know your phone had to be in there, and you were recording what you found on it. I want that phone. I want everything on it. Fuck you. 
I spat at him. That's all you'll get from me. Don't you know how serious what you're asking me to do is? Not for me, but for you. You're trying to betray members of your own clan now. We're all together, us and what's left of you, I added with a growl. It's better for you to keep your head down and fly under the radar. Maybe I won't tell Vincent what you just asked me to do. I'm not asking, I'm telling, he snarled. And why don't you tell Vincent? Yeah. Tell him why you were in Chicago. Tell him what my boss wanted you to do and why. Especially why. Just do me a favor and make sure I'm there to see it happen, because I would love to watch that snide son of a bitch get what's coming to him. What's coming to him? God, you're twisted, I whispered. Maybe that's what happens when you lose everything that mattered to you, he snapped. Everything that mattered. That can't be true. Even if it is, do you think you'll get anything back by, what? Waging another war. I don't care. You're right. I won't get anything back. But I'll know he suffered. I'll know members of his clan suffered and died, and it'll tear him the hell apart. And when I die, and I know I will because he'll see to it, I won't care. Because I'll still know that I caused his pain. He'll see what it's like to lose his family, his clan. He'll know how it feels to be at the mercy of another, to have to do what they say, to not have a choice. His words chilled me to the bone. So did the crazy look in his eyes, whenever the light from the lantern fell on them. You want me to get the phone, I repeated. That's right, smart guy. Bring it to me. Make sure I know how to get into it, and that the information is on the phone when you hand it over. No tricks. Or else what? I ax, raising my chin. Or else I go straight to Vincent and tell him what you did. That you had this information on members of your own clan. That you were gonna give it to Bradford so he could go after these guys and their families. That's what I'll do. And what'll happen to you then? He laughed. You might as well have died in that lab. You'll wish you had by the time he's done with you. I nodded slowly. Yeah. You're probably right. Grant? We both turned when we heard Daniela's voice. Get out of here, I warned him. Go. Now. Don't you touch her or even come near her. His smile curdled my blood. Maybe. Or maybe she'll make my acquaintance before I go back to Florida. You touch her and I swear I'll kill you, I promised. Hey. You might try but I'll make sure she never forgets me. The lantern went out. He disappeared into the darkness. Daniela. Stay where you are, I called out. What are you doing all the way out here, she asks. I'm serious. Just stay there. I'll come to you. I followed the sound of her voice, the scent of her. I had already committed her to memory. Why did you come out here? I wanted to know where you went. I tracked you. Why? I can't take a walk now? I tried to keep humor in my voice, but it didn't go well. Even I could hear how tight and stressed it sounded. Sure, you can take a walk. Just not when I'm naked in your bed. I mean, a girl could get a complex about herself if she knows a man is willing to leave her like that just to take a walk. What if I told you I always feel more energized after a good walk? I reached her side and she turned to me. I could feel her, even if I couldn't see her. Oh my goodness, she whispered, running her fingertips over my chest then down to my waist. You're still naked. You're very perceptive. My heart wasn't in it. My heart wasn't anywhere near it. But as long as I could keep her thinking along those lines, feeling playful, it meant we didn't have to talk about who I had just met up with. I took her hand. Come on. Let's go back to the tent. I think I just got my second wind. Chapter 11 Daniela I ran full out, pumping my legs faster and harder, determined to keep up with him. I wouldn't let him beat me. I might let him take control in bed, I loved it when he did, but I wouldn't let him beat me on the hunt. Nobody ever had. 
but he was just in front of me, edging further and further away. Slow down. No way. You getting tired? His voice was full of mirth. I heard the laughter in his mind as he pulled ahead and put even more distance between us. I snarled and snapped my teeth in his general direction, then decided to take another route. The rabbit had cut down a little path between two lines of trees. He took the path while I cut through the trees and tried to cut them both off. I came back out on the path, but this time I was way in front of Grant. I laughed to myself and put on more speed, I was getting tired, my ribs were starting to hurt from breathing so hard and fast, but it was more fun than I had had in ages. Especially since he was frustrated, because I was beating him. No fair, he called out in his mind. I heard the thudding of his paws against the ground, but I could see the rabbit just ahead too, its red tail bobbed up and down as it ran. I was so close. So close. I cried out in surprise when a pair of paws caught my back, and the weight of a full-grown dire wolf took me down. We rolled over and over, until we came to a stop against a fallen tree with me on my back under him. I shifted. So did he. The two of us panted hard. What was that all about? I asked pushing him up by his shoulders. I sat partway up, leaning back on my palms while he knelt over me. I'm sorry. I got a little too competitive, I guess. You guess? I ax. I wanted to knee him in the balls. You ruined the hunt, because you couldn't stand me catching the rabbit before you did. I tilted my head back, looking up at the sky, still breathing in hard gasps. Thanks a lot. Now I don't even get to eat. We'll find something bigger, he promised. A rabbit isn't big enough, anyway. No, but it would have been better than nothing and I was maybe ten seconds away from catching it. He let out an exasperated sigh. I'm not good with competition. I could tell. I should have been more considerate. Yes. You should have. I looked at him. It was obvious that he felt embarrassed and angry with himself and my heart softened. I touched his slightly sweaty face with a gentle hand. It's okay. Just get used to the idea that I'm gonna beat you on the hunt sometimes. Not if you don't learn to run a little faster, he grinned, leaning in, catching the corner of my mouth with his. Maybe it was because the wolf was still so close to the surface, or because my heart was already pounding and adrenaline was already racing through my veins, but the touch of his lips against mine set off an explosion deep inside. I reached for him, clawing at him, pulling him down on top of me. He grunted in surprise but didn't stop kissing me, if anything his lips were rougher, harder, more demanding. My entire body responded right away, almost violently. I rolled us over until he was on his back, and I was on top. What's this? he whispered, but the way his hand slid over my skin and the hard, thick erection between us told me he didn't mind. Sometimes I have to win, I whispered back with a smile, raising myself up just enough to guide him inside. I didn't take it slow. I didn't want to make love. I wanted to see what it was like when I let that other side of myself take over. I wanted it to take me away. Oh God, I grunted, closing my eyes, letting the urges control me. The urge to move up and down, grinding my hips, letting the friction build a sweet, delicious fire in me. His fingers hooked into claws as they raked down my back, then over my breasts. He took them in his hands, squeezing and playing with me. I rode faster in response, looking down at him through half-closed eyes, my mouth open so I could breathe. Yes, just like that. I moaned, throwing my head back. He ran his thumbs over my nipples before sliding further down. One of his hands found my hip and dug in until I winced, but I wouldn't tell him to stop. I loved how he wanted to possess me, how my body made him crazy. He grunted louder every time our bodies came together. The other had slid down my stomach, then around to my butt. His hard sharp slap made me yelp in surprise, but I rode even harder faster completely lost by then. It was better than I could ever have imagined. I dragged my nails over his chest, arching backward as an orgasm built. I knew it was coming, and I knew it would be big and loud, and I wished it would last forever. Yes. Grant. Now. Please fuck me. 
I moaned, rolling my head from side to side as he thrust from under me and doubled the intensity. He groaned, digging his fingers into my hips until it almost hurt, but I loved that too. I loved it all. The wolf howled in me and I let it out, screaming into the darkness. I thought I would shatter into a million pieces. When I finished, I fell across him. His heavy breathing in my ear and the way his hands still roamed over my sweat-slick skin told me he wasn't finished. And when the pulsing of my muscles slowed down, I still felt him inside me. It's my turn, he growled, and I was on my back again before I knew it. He didn't try to be sweet or romantic or even gentle. Instead, he drove me into the dirt with every thrust, growling in my ear, faster and harder and with no apologies. He took what he wanted the way I had, and I gave it to him. I was never so happy to give anything. Daniela, Daniela. Oh, fuck it. He thrust once more, going stiff and still just before he let go. I smiled over his shoulder. Almost better than a hunt, I whispered with a soft giggle. He chuckled against my neck before kissing it. Except now I'm hungrier than ever, he groaned. My stomach growled in response, and I giggled again. This time, let's work together, okay? We can catch something bigger that way. Chapter 12 Grant I have to be honest with you. It's been eating at me all day. Daniela rolled onto her side, sitting halfway up. We had given up the cot and made a bed on the floor of the tent instead. Oh, thank God. I knew there was something on your mind. I knew there had to be more to that bullshit out in the woods than competitiveness. You're right. I mean, I'm sort of a dick when it comes to competition, but still. I wouldn't have tackled you if I wasn't already frazzled. I ran my hand over my face. I wish there was an easy way to tell you about this. Just tell me. Please. She placed one hand on my chest over my heart telling me she believed in me, that she still trusted my heart. It gave me a little bit of comfort. I found the bear. I knew you did. I knew it. You can't lie to me. Don't you know that by now? I rolled my eyes. Anyway, he's an East Wing. And he wants the information I gathered for Bradford. What? Why? She sat up, breathing heavy, eyes wide. Calm down. I imagined him out there, listening. I would never tell her about that part. I didn't want her to be afraid that he was out there somewhere, listening to us, watching us. I would worry about that for the both of us. I just don't understand, is all. But she did keep her voice under control. You think I do? He explained the whole damn thing to me, and I don't have a clue what he thinks he's going to get out of it. Revenge? On who? Beats me. Vincent? I don't know what he thinks it's going to accomplish. Things are better, people are happy, the clans are together. He's insane. That's the only explanation. I don't get it, though. She pulled her knees to her chest and wrapped her arms around them. I mean, how did he know you were here? He heard, the same as the guys did. They came looking, and so did he. Everybody got lucky. Yay. I pushed myself up on my elbows. And they took my things from the hotel I stayed in. Including my phone, where I was putting my notes. No. He wants it. I still don't understand. I mean, if he wanted to find these things out, he could find them out on his own now. Right. Because the clans are together. You're thinking like a rational person, Besides, I already did the legwork. Why do it himself, when I already have a list of the strongest members and their families, where they live, all that? I threw myself back again, and looked up at the canvas above my head. There's one more thing I don't understand. Just one. I ask. What's he going to do, if you don't give him the phone? What does he have on you? I should have known that was coming. The big question. He was there, at the meeting with Bradford. I completely forgot about him. I guess people like him are trained to blend into the walls. Or I was so shocked by what Bradford said, I forgot everything else. Who knows? 
He knows what Bradford blackmailed you with. Right. She waited a minute. I could almost taste her hesitation. She wanted to know, she wanted it bad, but she didn't know how to ask. I couldn't bring myself to tell her. It would mean admitting what an awful person I was. She would know, and she could never not know. She would never forget. And she would never see me the same away again. I would lose her. It's not my place, she whispered. It's not my place. Trying to convince yourself. Maybe. She looked at me with the saddest eyes I had ever seen. I'm sorry, but I can't help wondering what was so bad that you were willing to go that far, and you're still afraid. I'm not afraid. Yes. I think you are. There's nothing wrong with being afraid. I hated her just then. For the briefest, most painful second, I hated her. For knowing me so well. For being able to see through me. It didn't seem fair. I had never felt so exposed, so completely naked. No shield, no disguise. She saw right through me. I hated her for it. But the feeling went away just as fast as it flared up. It wasn't her fault that I was such a liar. It's something I've tried to push way deep down inside me for a long, long time, I whispered. I couldn't look at her. It was easier to look up at the tent and pretend I was talking to myself. You've got to understand that when you hold something like that inside you for so long and work hard to convince yourself that nobody will ever forgive you for, you can't just come out and tell the truth. It's not that easy. That makes sense. I made myself look at her again. She waited patiently, silently. I believed it when she said she would never force me to tell her. It wasn't gossip to her, and she didn't need to know. She cared enough about me to want to help. That was all. I'll tell you eventually. I promise. It's gonna take a little more time. I reached for her, and she didn't flinch away. When Jason and Cord pulled in at the campsite the next morning, I was waiting for them. I had barely slept, lying there, staring up at the canvas, listening to Daniela breathing. That was my night. That and thinking. A lot of it. There was no way I could ask her to be with me, build a life with me, trust me, if I didn't start with a clean slate. That was the only way we could be really happy together. Otherwise, I'd always look over my shoulder. There would always be a wall between us. She would feel that, and it would make her unhappy. She would pull away from me, not immediately, but over time. That was if I didn't pull away from her and that would be the end of us. I wouldn't go into the rest of my life with her if we didn't have a chance. She was worth too much. Jace waved as they walked over to where I stood, under a big tree that had probably grown in that spot since before there was a camp, before there were even many people in the area. I wondered how much it had seen as I leaned against its rough cool bark. There were probably a lot of people in the past who thought they had troubles, and they were probably right. Everything was relative. Their issues were very real to them, even if they weren't as big as what I was facing. But those people were long gone too, and their problems went with them. Maybe they weren't so big after all. Maybe nothing was in the grand scheme of things. You look like you're about a million miles away, Cord said with a laugh. Yeah, I thought you would look a lot more, ah, uh, relaxed this morning. Jace winked, and the two of them elbowed each other. I chuckled. That doesn't solve everything. Maybe not everything, but a lot of things. Cord grinned. Which is why my wife wants me home as soon as I can get there. Well, one reason why, Jace added, laughing at himself. Probably not a very big reason, I muttered, and we laughed together. I felt more like myself when I laughed with them. I could almost pretend like there was nothing wrong. I would have to go back around ten years for that to be true, though. I looked at them both, arms folded. Did you ever get my things from the hotel back in Chicago? Is that what's on your mind? Jace acts with a grin. Yeah, we even brought your phone with us, left it at the motel until now. Where is it? In my pocket, 
he replied, narrowing his eyes a little. What's up? This was it. I had a choice to make. I could go one way and keep deceiving the people who meant the most in the world to me and probably screw up the rest of my life in the process, or I could go another way and face whatever consequences came after that. Goosebumps rose up over my skin. The moment of truth. Don't take the phone out, I murmured. It suddenly hit me that there could be a bear watching. Listening. In fact, let's get away from here. I want to go to Lance's cabin. I think there's something we all need to talk about, including your father. Dad. Jace looked at Cord. They wore identical looks of shock. I nodded with a grimace. Yeah. He'll want to hear what I have to say. There was no going back. Chapter 13 Daniela I was still shoving my foot into one of my sandals as I hopped on the other foot across the campground. Once I had it in place, I ran as fast as my legs could take me over to Lance's cabin. Ever since Grant stuck his head in the tent and told me to get dressed and be there as soon as possible, my heart had been racing like an express train. What was happening? What was he going to do? I reached the door and couldn't slow myself down in time to keep from hurtling through it. Jace and Cord were there, I felt like a clumsy breathless oaf and wished Grant had let me know they were around. Hi guys, I gasped. Layla handed me a bottle of water with a wry smile. Maybe the first time I've ever seen you look flustered, she whispered. I stuck my tongue out at her. What's going on? I murmured, looking around the room. Is that Daniela I hear? I jumped and glared at the cell phone sitting on the bedside table. I had no idea it was in use. The voice on the other end had been deep and strident. Yeah, that's Daniela. Grant looked at me, sitting on the edge of the bed in front of the phone. Daniela, this is Vincent. He's the leader of the Everglade clan. I gaped at Grant. Nice to meet you. Sort of, I said, at a loss. Another person he didn't tell me would be involved. What was going on? Vincent chuckled. Same here. I was just telling Grant how overjoyed I am that he's safe. It's been a very happy couple of days since Jace first confirmed Grant's presence in your group. I'd like to thank whoever was responsible for freeing him, not to mention keeping him safe these last two weeks. I'm glad to know he has good people around him. Lance cleared his throat. He looked completely at a loss, at least I wasn't the only one wondering what the hell was going on. It's been a pleasure, sir. Vincent, now that Daniela's here, I want to get to business. There's a reason I felt we should talk before I come home. My eyes went wide, and all the breath left my body when my mouth fell open. No way. He was doing it. I waited for him to look at me, but he didn't. Or wouldn't. I wished he would, since I wanted him to know I was there to support him. I was behind him all the way. What's happening? Layla whispered. I took her arm and shook my head just enough for her to see. She trembled a little. I wondered why he was doing this in front of her and Lance, unless he didn't know how to ask them to leave their own cabin. Or maybe he was afraid Vincent would tell him not to come home and wanted to be sure there were witnesses to what happened next. Like his friends turning on him, attacking him. My blood ran cold. What's the trouble? Vincent asks. Remember, whatever you need, I'm happy to provide it to you. Additional care, a little time away from everything, anything. Just ask and it's yours. What about forgiveness? Is forgiveness something you think you can spare? Our eyes met finally and I nodded with tears in my eyes. He was really going to do it. And I loved him. I knew it then, a fact, something as basic and vital as my heart beating. He was the bravest, best man I had ever met, and he had me forever. Forgiveness? What could I possibly have to forgive you for? It isn't your fault you were captured, Vincent said. But there was an edge to his voice that wasn't there before. I wondered if I was the only one who heard it. Jace and Cord were too busy looking at each other and shrugging to notice, I guessed. 
No, but if I hadn't been in Chicago, none of this would have happened. And I wasn't out there for the reason I gave you. Silence on both ends of the call. The cabin suddenly felt very cold. Layla took my hand. What were you doing out there, then? Vincent asked in a very measured voice. He was doing everything he could to keep himself in check, I realized. It reminded me of the way my parents would talk to me when I was a kid, and they knew I did something bad. Did he already know? Was he just waiting for Grant to tell him the truth? Grant took a deep breath. I wished he would look at me again. I hoped he told the whole truth, because I was starting to think Vincent was even smarter than Grant gave him credit for. I was a spy for Bradford Eastwing. Jace snarled under his breath. Cord gasped. Layla's hand was a vice around mine, squeezing harder and harder. Grant closed his eyes and exhaled, it was like watching a balloon deflate. It took him so much just to say those words. I was proud of him. Lance took a protective step toward Layla, standing in front of her just a little. In case all hell broke loose. You were a spy. It wasn't a question. It was a statement. Like he was trying to make sense of it, or only repeating what he already knew. I couldn't figure out which one it was. Yes. Or I would have been, if I'd had the chance to give Bradford the information he sent me out there to get. Which was? The names and locations of the clan's strongest Midwest members. Specifically, where their families lived. For the sake of having leverage on those members. Fucking bastard, Cord growled. My eyes darted over to where he and Jace stood. They both practically vibrated with rage. They would shift soon if they didn't keep their cool. Cord please, Vincent said. His voice was stern. Just like that, a little of the tension in the room dissolved and I could breathe again. Barely, but better than before. Let me guess, Jace muttered. The information was on your phone, which was why you ax if I had it. Right, but not for the reason you're thinking. Oh? What am I thinking, he ax. That I wanted to erase it. Well, he ax. The word echoed through the cabin. He took a deep breath. I reminded myself to breathe with him. Because there's somebody else here. Somebody followed you too. He wants the information. He still wants to use it. Who? Vincent asks. Meanwhile both Jace and Cord went to the windows and peered outside. Lance sat Layla down and stood by her side. The tension was electric, crackling through the room. I was sure my hair would stand on end. I don't know his name, Grant admitted. He was one of Bradford's guards or something. I don't know that for sure either. But he was at the meeting Bradford called me to. He knew Bradford called on me to spy for him. He's not happy about the clan's merging, and says there are a few others who feel the way he did. He wants to use that information, I don't know how, exactly. He wouldn't say. The bear, Jace growled, looking back at Grant. He nodded miserably. Yeah. The bear. I had the feeling it was somebody looking for me. So I found him in the woods yesterday and we had it out. He wants the phone. I won't give it to him. I would rather tell the truth and face the consequences than let anybody tell me what to do, ever again. How could you do it in the first place? Cord demanded. Vincent cleared his throat. We all waited for what he would say. My heart was in my throat. Would he tell his son to kill Grant? I wasn't sure how things like this were handled in big clans like the Everglades. I looked at Layla and Lance, who were just as lost as me. Grant, I want to know something, Vincent said. He sounded much calmer than I would have expected. I'm not sure I would have been so calm if somebody had just dropped a bomb like that on me. What is it? Grant asks. I dug my nails into my palms, wanting to scream. Why did you do it? What did he have on you? I know it had to be something serious, because I've known you since you were born, and I know this isn't like you. There are men in the clan who I always feel as though I have to keep an eye on because they have it in them to turn on me. Whoever waves the most money around or promises the biggest or best position in the clan 
is the person they'll give their allegiance to. But not you. I've always wondered why you would spy for Bradford. I was pretty sure we all gasped at the same time. Grant's head snapped up and his eyes met mine. They were wide wild. What did you just say, he sputtered. Dad, what are you talking about? Jace asks. I'm telling you, I already knew what happened last year. Bradford had his spies. So did I, I knew why he sent you to Chicago. But, I don't understand, why didn't you stop me? Grant asks. Because I wanted to see if you would go through with it. Or whether you would come clean with me when you got home. If you would go to him. I would have stopped you before you got there, don't get me wrong. Jesus. Grant doubled over, elbows on his knees, and buried his face in his hands. When you disappeared, I assumed at first that Bradford had already gone in for what he wanted from you. I assumed he killed you, so you could never tell me the truth. But my spies in his clan told me the opposite. He didn't know what happened either, and thought I might have done the deed myself when I found out you had betrayed us. Neither of us could have known the truth. So you both thought the other one killed him, Jace repeated, shaking his head. Yes. Over time, I thought about it. I thought about it a lot. No matter what had happened, the question of why remained. Why would you do it? Your father was my best friend. I've thought of you as a son ever since his death, and I've always tried to do the right thing by you. Why would you lie to me? Risk other members of our clan? Grant straightened. His hands shook. I wanted to take them in mine and hold them still. I wanted to comfort him. Out of everybody in the room, only I knew what it meant for him to tell the truth. I wished I could spare him that, but it was his life and his truth and he was the only one who could make things right. I don't know how he knew, Grant murmured just loud enough for all of us to hear. I don't know what made him look into the case. I really don't. What case? Jace asks. He was still angry. Furious. But a little confused, too. Probably wondering why his father hadn't shared the truth with him. Lance used to act that way, whenever Jordan didn't tell him everything on his mind. The male ego, so fragile. The car crash, Grant said. He sounded broken, like a little boy. The one with your parents? Vincent asks. Yeah. What made him look into it, I'll never know. Maybe he only did it when he decided he wanted to use me. Or maybe the explanation of the crash never sat well with him. God, he was like a spider, wasn't he? Always spinning webs, always trying to trap people in them. He was good at that, Vincent agreed. He could tell from the police report that something wasn't right. Or he just had his suspicions and decided to confront me and trick me into agreeing with him. I don't know. But it's something I never wanted any of you to find out. I would have done anything. I was desperate. His voice shook the way his hands did. Tears filled my eyes, blurring everything. I blinked them away. What did he know? Vincent asks. He sounded like a father guiding his child into telling a painful truth. I heard a lot of love in his voice. That dad wasn't driving the car that night. Chapter 14 Daniela Grant turned his face away from all of us. I gasped and covered my mouth. Tears rolled over my fingers. Jace muttered a curse under his breath. Cord reeled. You were, Vincent asked. It was almost a whisper. I didn't want to. He wanted me to get my license so he could stop having to take me from place to place. I wanted it too, but I wasn't ready. I hadn't had enough practice. Mom didn't want me to drive either, it was dark and too late at night for me to be on the road. There were all kinds of people out that late at night, she said. Drunk people, people coming from parties. But he insisted. There was no getting through to him when he was that determined. He wanted me to man up and drive. I believe that. He was impossible once he got an idea in his head, Vincent said. Grant nodded, still facing the wall. So I got behind the wheel and started out. It was all right at first. I thought I would make it home okay, 
and Dad would hold it over my head for weeks that I was too afraid to drive ten minutes from the restaurant to our house. The road we usually took was pretty empty too, not a lot of people drove down it as a rule. But then, his head dropped between his shoulders. Then, Vincent prompted, the deer ran out into the road and I panicked. We weren't even all that close to it for Christ's sake, but I freaked out and lost control of the car and hit that tree head on. It all came out in a single breath. His shoulder shook as he wept silently. My heart broke for him. I took a step toward him but he held up a hand to stop me without looking. He didn't want me to touch him. My arms ached to hold him. I had never felt so useless. Silence fell over the room as the rest of us absorbed the story. Vincent cleared his throat and when he spoke his voice was thick with emotion. But the police said he was driving. I panicked, Grant whispered. I was just a stupid kid. Sixteen years old. I saw my entire life flash before my eyes. I knew they were dead and I had killed them and I didn't know what to do. Mom was across the back seat, and Dad was slumped over in the passenger seat. His head had hit the dashboard. There was blood running down his face. I was going to prison for the rest of my life. So, so I. I unbuckled his belt and dragged him over to the driver's seat. I still don't remember giving it much thought, you know? I was just reacting. I buckled him in and slumped him over the steering wheel and I told everybody that I had been in the passenger seat. That he was making me watch him drive because I had my test coming up. And everybody believed it, Jace murmured. The fight was gone. His shoulders were slumped. He sounded shell-shocked. You know how the cops treat cases when they have to do with us, Grant said staring at the wall. They don't know what to expect, and they assume too much. They figured Dad's body was strong enough that the impact didn't cave in his chest the way it would have in a human. They were wrong about that, and Bradford knew it. I guess he got a hold of the reports, I don't know. Maybe the autopsies, even. He was capable of a lot of things. He put two and two together, and told me he knew I was the one driving. And that he would make sure the cops knew, too. I didn't even care about that. I only cared about what would happen when you found out, Vincent. Me, he asks. You two were always so close. I killed your best friend. I was sure you would never forgive me. Yeah, I knew I was digging myself into an even deeper hole, but I just couldn't bear thinking about life without my clan. Even if it meant hurting some of us, it was better than being on my own. An outcast. Going on trial, without any support. Going to prison, knowing nobody on the outside cared if I rotted in there. He shook his head with a bitter laugh. I know none of it makes sense now, when I'm actually sitting and thinking about it afterward. But at the time? He knew how to twist the knife in my heart. He painted a pretty ugly picture of what would happen once the truth got out. Just when I thought I couldn't hate him more than I already did, Cord snarled. He wouldn't stop at anything, Vincent agreed, then sighed deeply. You've carried this around with you for a long time. Yeah. Ever since that night. And you don't know how I tortured myself, especially in that lab. If I hadn't panicked and lost control of the car. If I hadn't lied about who was driving. If I hadn't agreed to spy. I know. I forgave you for the spying a long time ago, Vincent said. You don't have to worry about that. I knew you had your reasons, whatever they were. I never imagined it was anything like this. You don't have to bother trying to forgive me for that. I'll never forgive myself, Grant whispered. I don't think it's up to any of us to forgive you, Vincent mused. It's not any of us who died. But know this, it was an accident. Anybody with half a brain could tell you that. You didn't do it maliciously. And I knew your father. I loved him like a brother, he was the brother I always wished I'd had, instead of the one given to me. And I know how many times I wished I could knock some sense into him, when he got an idea in his head. I can just imagine how he must have pressured you that night. I'm sorry your mother lost her life because of his stubbornness, 
but I always knew he would end up getting himself killed one way or another because he didn't know how to back down. Besides, there's no telling how things would have turned out if your father was the one driving. He always drove too fast, which was why it was easy for me to believe your story. Things might have turned out the same. Or worse. You could have been killed too. You don't know how many times I've wished I was, Grant said. I'm sure. I think it's time for you to let go of that. What about the police, he asks. I don't think they have to be involved in this. Do you? By now, anything we tell them would be impossible to prove. The car was destroyed a long time ago. All they have to go on is the police report, and like you said, the police don't want much to do with our problems. Grant finally turned around so we could see his face. He blinked, disbelieving. You mean you think I should get away without being punished? He acts, almost like he was afraid to think it was true. Don't you think you've been punished enough already? Vincent acts, and there was enough sadness in his voice to make me cry again. Layla leaned against Lance, shaking with sobs. Even Jace and Cord looked overcome with emotion, but men like them didn't cry. Jace went to Grant and held out his hand. He's right. There's nothing anybody could do now that would be worse than what's already happened. You did your time and then some. Grant shook his hand then shook cords. I had never seen so much relief on a person's face before. What do we do with whoever's trying to get the phone from Grant? Cord acts, looking over at the phone. What did he look like? Vincent acts. Grant described him tall, thin, with dark hair and a widow's peak over his forehead. He was once a guard for Bradford, or an advisor. Someone who worked close to him. All right. I'll have feelers put out for him. In the meantime, keep looking out. There's no telling what someone like him will do, when he finds out there's no leverage anymore. He's probably insane. Probably? Grant snorted. He's definitely unhinged. Even more reason to be careful. And Lance, I'm sorry this trouble has reached you. Keep your people close. Will do, he said. Vincent? Thank you. Grant's face was a blank mask, but I heard everything I needed to know in his voice. He was overcome, beyond grateful. The sort of thing a person couldn't put into words. Just come home. It's been too long. There are people here who miss you. With that, Vincent ended the call. Grant looked around the room, still a little unsure of himself. Lance stepped up. All right. I'm gonna bring in a few of my most trusted members and let them know about the potential threat. We're here for anything you need, Jace assured him. He won't get into the camp, and he won't come near any of your people. We'll take him out. We should be smart about this, Grant said standing. Let him think I have the phone, and I'll give it to him. I remember where he's been hiding in the woods, or the general area. It's not too hard to track him. He doesn't know I'm not still trying to hide anything from you guys. I can lure him in, especially if he's watching and he sees me with the phone. I don't like that idea, I said. I couldn't keep quiet. Not when it came to him taking chances. He won't get near me, Grant said, avoiding my eyes. My heart twinged. I hoped it was all because he didn't think I would want him anymore, and not because anything had changed between us. I would do everything I could to make sure he knew I still wanted him. More than ever. We'll make sure of that, Jace promised. Here. He reached into his pocket and withdrew a phone, then handed it to Grant. I hate this thing, Grant muttered, looking down at it. I wish it had gotten lost. I want to throw it into the lake. Not yet, Cord reminded him, then clapped him on the shoulder. All right. We'll get out of here, try to look casual, whatever. You can walk around with the phone, let him see you. But away from the main area, Lance added. Of course. Maybe out in the parking lot, Jay suggested. Someplace away from the others. Lance left to talk to a few of the members of the pack. Layla said, I'll stay here. Daniela, you should stay with me. I just want to go back to the tent for a second. I'll come right back. I tried to smile at Grant to catch his eye. 
something to let him know that I still cared about him. He pretended to be too busy talking with Jace to notice. Don't let it get to you, I said to myself as I walked to the tent. My eyes moved from side to side, like I might catch sight of a bear barreling out of the woods in my direction. Everything looked fine. It was a beautiful day. Grant would lure the sick freak out with the phone and Jace and Cord, they would take care of him. I was in such a hurry to get out of the tent earlier, I hadn't even put on underwear. And everything in there was a mess, just the way we had left it. I went through my bag to pull out clean clothes, when a rustling noise at the back of the tent turned my blood to ice. A high, thin laugh filled the air. I thought you would never get here, pretty girl. Then he rushed me. I didn't have time to scream. Chapter 15 Grant Where is he? I muttered, walking back and forth. Back and forth. The phone felt a lot heavier in my hand than it actually was. All in my head. I knew Jace was watching from one side of the clearing, while Cord was watching from the other side. Lance and his guys were keeping watch over the camp. Nobody had made a sound or spoken a word since I had started walking around, feeling like the world's biggest idiot. Dangling a bait that nobody was taking. What if he already knew somehow? No, that was impossible. He wasn't that smart. He wasn't watching the cabin either. Jace or Cord would have seen him, standing by the windows like they were. He wanted to see me squirm. That was the problem. He thought he was in control, and wanted to hold it over my head as long as he could. Probably the only time he ever felt like he was special was when he had somebody by the balls. A trick he had learned from his old boss, I guessed. I checked the time. Thirty minutes had passed. The sun was getting higher in the sky and baking my skin. Sweat rolled down my back. How long was long enough? When would he show himself and get it over with? I was ready to slam the damn phone into the ground and stomp it into nothing but shards of glass and bits of plastic. Even then I wasn't sure where I would rather be, baking under the midday sun, feeling like a chump or with Daniela. If it meant not having to face her when she told me how disgusted she was with me, I was willing to pace back and forth as long as it took. How could she still want me after all that? There was no way. I knew I would never want to see me again if I heard that truth for the first time. Two people were dead because of me, not just two people, my parents. How could she even look at me? She was probably just trying to save face back at the cabin. I would have done the same thing. My hand tightened around the phone. I wanted her. More than anything. I would fight for her if I thought there was the slightest chance of getting her back. But I had to face facts too. There might not be a chance. As big as her heart was, as sweet and beautiful and kind as she was, there had to be a limit. Everybody had their limit. The sight of Lance walking up to me was a surprise. What's up? I asked when I saw the frown lines that creased his forehead. Have you seen Daniela? My heart stalled. Right then, everything stopped. The world stopped turning. Everything stopped making sense. Just like the crash. When I came to and saw my father's blank eyes staring at me. When I knew he was dead and mom was dead and there was nothing I could do about it. That heart-stopping moment when I wished more than anything that I would die too. He took her. I was never so sure of anything in my life. I started off at a sprint, but Lance caught me. Wait up, wait up. I was only asking, because she told Layla she would come back to the cabin. And she never did, right? She never came back. I pushed him away and even dropped the phone. The phone didn't matter anymore. I ran straight to the tent and flung the flap open. Empty. The scent of bear hung heavy in the air. Fucker. I meant for it to come out as a roar. I thought it would. Instead, it sounded like a whisper. What's happening? Jace caught up, then saw what I saw. He sniffed the air. He took her. He must have heard us. My stomach clenched. My head spun. 
the thought of what he was doing to her, the many things he could be doing to her, ran through my head and made me sick. It was overwhelming. I didn't know which thought to focus on first. How? We were watching out, Jay sputtered. He spied on us one night, and we didn't know he was anywhere near the tent. Maybe Bradford taught him a thing or two about spying, I don't know. I held my head in my hands, it would fall off my shoulders if I didn't hold it in place. The whole world spun around me. Daniela's face, her laugh, the way she never pushed me into telling her the truth about why I didn't want to go home. The way she smelled and tasted and felt in my arms. The way she was probably dead already, and it was all my stupid fault. I had killed somebody else. We have to find him, I said over and over. The woods. He would have taken her to the woods if none of us saw him anywhere else. There's a million places to hide in there. I couldn't breathe. If she died, I would die too. I couldn't live without her. There was no reason to live if she was gone. But there was a chance she was still alive. That chance, the thought that she might still be out there somewhere, needing me to find her, cleared my head and gave me laser focus. It was all so obvious. If he meant to kill her, he would have done it here, I said, looking around. He would have left her here for me to find. So, he wants to be sure I see whatever it is he plans on doing. He wants to make me pay for whatever. Not getting back to Bradford with the information, maybe. Not giving them the edge they thought would help them win the war. Or maybe he just wants me to feel pain. I don't know. Where do we go? Lance acts. I'll lead the way. I think we should shift, Jay said. You can if you want to, but I want to talk to that fucker before I kill him. I marched out of the tent and followed my sense of smell. It wasn't as strong as a human, but I could still pick up sense a human couldn't. And I could smell him. And her. They were together. I cast my mind back to when I found him before and followed the trail. The broken sapling. I climbed over it and kept walking. I heard Jason Cord and Lance behind me all in their animal forms. Cord was a bear and a big one. He could help take down somebody like him, or at least hold him down while I tore his throat out. I stopped and sniffed the air. Jace reached my side and looked up at me. What do you think? I asked. His amber eyes closed and he sniffed the air. He raised one paw, pointing left. Yeah. I think you're right, I muttered. He ran next to me, as we followed the scent deeper into the woods. It was just as dark as before, and my eyes weren't as sharp as they were when I shifted. I fell back a few steps and followed Jace, who made sure I didn't trip over any unseen roots or undergrowth. Still, even though my eyes weren't as good, I saw the lantern before he did. I touched his flank, signaling him to stop. He did, and the others came to a stop behind us. There. I raised my arm. He has a lantern. Maybe he stole it from camp. There's a sort of cave there, and that's where he's been staying. I'll go in first. I can follow the lantern. You guys come in from the sides. One of you behind me. The cave will block his rear. They looked at me, and I could feel them telling me to be careful. I nodded, then headed for the lantern. The whole way, all I could think about was Daniela. She was there. I knew she was alive. She had to be. She was cold probably in the deep woods where there was almost no sun. Scared. Wondering what was taking me so long. I hoped she knew I would come for her. I hoped she had that much faith in me. What was I thinking, not responding to her back at the cabin? When all she had wanted to do was let me know she was still in my corner, but I was so sure she would never want me again afraid of getting pushed away, so I had pushed first. What the hell was my problem? There was movement up ahead. Something on the ground, wiggling around. I looked in all directions, the others weren't far behind, but where was the bear? The shape on the ground was Daniela. I recognized the dress she was wearing at the cabin, but she was alone. He had stuffed something in her mouth and tied her wrists and legs. I dared move a few steps closer. 
There was an ugly purple bruise on her forehead. Blood trickled from it. I guess that was all that kept her from shifting. She was hurting too much to think about it. He was out there somewhere, probably trapping me into going for her. But I had to. I couldn't leave her lying in the dirt, bound and gagged. My eyes moved in all directions as I took one step, then another, slow and measured. I breathed as slowly as possible too, keeping my heart rate down, keeping myself calm. I needed to focus. I had to be aware of him when he came at me. Her eyes widened when she saw me. I held a finger to my lips as I closed the distance between us and worked on her wrists. He had used her underwear to tie her up. The thought of him even touching her things. I pulled the gag from her mouth in time for her to scream, Above you. I looked up as he was falling down on me. No. Jumping down from the rock slab that formed the top of the cave. I rolled out of the way and he landed between us, cursing and snarling. Go. Go. I shouted at Daniela as he threw himself at me. Her ankles were still bound, but she could drag herself away and untie them. I didn't see anything but him once he was on me. He knocked the wind out of me, but I recovered fast enough to roll on top of him. His jaws snapped and saliva flew in all directions. He was more than half crazy for sure. Adrenaline flooded my veins as we fought and clawed, both of us screaming in fury. I rolled on top again and this time held him down with my weight focused on his arms and chest. He roared, but I held him down. You have nothing. I spat in his face. You'll die with nothing, you scum. Just like your boss died. A loser, right up until the end. The wolf howled inside me and begged to be free, but I held it back. I wanted to look into his eyes as a man and see him knowing I had beaten him. He ground his teeth and struggled to get up from under me, but I outweighed him. He might have made a strong bear, but he was a weak man. Shut up. You didn't know him, he growled. He was like my father. Like father, like son, I growled in response. That was when his body started changing. I knew the shift was coming, and I sprang up and away as my own shift took place. I hadn't meant for it to happen that way, but I wouldn't face him as a man. Not when he was a bear. My wolf howled with joy as I released it. We flew at each other, crashing together, teeth and claws and fur, grappling as we both tried to take control of the other. Everything flashed in front of my eyes, the cave, the lantern, Daniela's panicked face as she watched. I saw Jace too and sent out a single message, number. I wanted him for myself. He swiped at me in that instant when he knew my focus wasn't on him, and I howled in pain when his claws tore into my flesh. In an instant blood soaked into my fur. The pain made me more focused than ever on hurting him. Killing him. I bit his shoulder, and he roared, throwing his head back in agony and panic, exposing his throat. We both went down just as my teeth sank into his jugular and the satisfaction I felt as his blood flowed down my chin and throat was almost scary. I had never taken pleasure in killing before, not even when I hunted down bigger animals than me. But this, this was triumph. He still tried to fight, but he got weaker with every frantic beat of his heart, pumping more blood out of his torn throat. His paws stopped moving. His arms weren't gripping me anymore. He went slack as the life drained out of him. And it was over. Grant. Daniela ran to me, threw her arms around my neck, though it was covered in blood. Oh, Grant? Come on. Jace had shifted back and was standing in front of us. We have to get away from here. And we have to clean you up. I nodded and let him and the rest of them led me back to camp. It was over. Finally. All over. Chapter 16 Daniela When I came to, he told me he was smarter than all of us. He knew you were going to trick him. He was listening behind the cabin. I shuddered. He wanted to stun you, then make you watch while he killed me. He actually said he was going to kill me while you watched. He's gone now, Jace murmured. 
Thanks to a hell of a strong set of jaws, Cord grinned. Grant only shook his head. He was way more subdued than the two of them, and had been ever since we left the woods. A long shower had cleaned him up, and the wound the bear had inflicted was already healing. But inside was a different story. It wasn't my jaws that killed him, or anything I did. It was him. He had a choice. He didn't have to come here, and he didn't have to take her. His hand closed over the one of mine that wasn't holding an ice pack to my head. He signed his own death warrant when he did that. I warmed all over. We hadn't gotten the chance yet to talk things over between us, but he was much more willing to show his feelings than he was when I left Lance's cabin. All it took was a huge bump on my head, and the threat of my murder. No big deal? Well, that's that. Jace looked at the two of us with a wry grin. I guess you'll be planning your flight home now? I glanced at Grant, waiting. I would follow his lead. I would follow him anywhere. He nodded. Yes. I'll be planning my flight. We will, I corrected. He turned to me, eyes searching my face. I only nodded with a smile. Cord cleared his throat a little louder than necessary. Oh, look at the time. I think I have to go, do something. He wandered out of the tent, and Jace followed him after grinning at Grant. He waited until we were truly alone before asking, You mean it? Are you nuts? Of course I mean it. I was already planning on going, before any of this happened. He shook his head. But that was before. I cut him off. Before you told us what happened? How Bradford blackmailed you. Right? Listen to me, and hear me well because I won't say it again. I dropped the ice pack and took his hands. They were warm, strong, and they had helped kill the monster who was set on killing me. I held them tight. What you did in the past has nothing to do with who you are now. Vincent was right. You did your time. You punished yourself, and that was before you ever stepped foot in that lab. It has to be enough. You have to stop thinking it matters so much to me. You can't pretend it doesn't matter at all. I sighed and shook my head. It was an accident. A terrible one. My heart broke for you back there in that cabin. It really did. I only wanted to hold you, and tell you everything would be all right. You did? Of course. I can't help but imagine the kid you were, how scared you were. How awful it must have been to see your parents like that. It hurts me to even think about it, and they weren't my parents. So it must have been a thousand times worse for you. You have no idea, he muttered. You were a kid. You made a mistake. A couple of mistakes. It was wrong of Bradford to take advantage of that. I'm glad he's gone, I whispered. Not as glad as me. I let go of one of his hands and reached for his face. The muscles in his jaw jumped like he was holding back a flood of emotion. It's over, I said, looking him straight in the eye. I almost can't believe it. You know? It's like I'm afraid to, in case I wake up and this was all a dream. Believe it. I leaned in and kissed him gently. I wanted that kiss to say so much. I wanted it to heal him, to tell him I was in it for the long haul. That he wasn't getting rid of me. His words said it best though. I love you, Daniela. He touched his forehead to mine and sighed. I love you so much. You're everything to me. I would have died if I lost you back there. I smiled through fresh tears. I love you too. We kissed again, and again, although my head was still a little too sore to get into anything serious. I touched gentle fingers to the bump and winced. His expression darkened. I could kill him all over again for doing that to you. I shrugged it off. I'll be better by bedtime. Now, tell me about Florida. Are there really as many bugs there as people say there are? I mean, Am I gonna have to stock up on bug spray or what? Epilogue Daniela In the not-so-far future I thought you would never get here. Nia threw her arms around my neck and squeezed until I saw stars. 
You're choking me, I laughed and she loosened up. Sorry sorry. I just missed you so much. She stepped aside so Grant and I could cross the threshold into the house. House was not the right word, not even close, and by now I was used to hanging out in Vincent's mansion. The house Nia shared with the rest of Drew's family was more like a compound, with a separate wing for each couple. The main building, the one Drew used to share with his brother and cousins, was where Jordan lived and served as a common area. This is beautiful. You've always described it as big, but I had no idea. Just the entryway was impressive, along with the view of the woods around the house through the plate glass windows that lined the outer walls. It was almost like being in the woods, even though we were inside. I could see why Nia loved living there so much. Let's not tell Vincent too much about this place, Grant muttered as he looked around. He'll insist on building a new house just like it. That might not be so bad, living in a compound like this. I slid my arms around his waist. I thought you liked having privacy, he grinned. There's still plenty of privacy here, Nia broke in from the stairs where she was already halfway up with two of our bags. Each wing is like its own little home. And they're not little, believe me. You're in a hurry to get us settled, I laughed. We didn't have a choice but to follow her up with the rest of our luggage. Yeah, well, I have something I want to show you. She opened the door, and I squealed in surprise when Layla and Lance's little boy toddled out to meet us in the hallway. Stephen. I laughed, looking at Nia as I swung him up on my hip. It took you long enough. Layla came running out to wrap me and her little boy in a long hug. I don't believe it. How come neither of you told me? I thought you couldn't make the wedding. We wanted to keep the surprise, Layla said, and she tried to take the baby. Oh no. Please. I love holding him, it's such a treat. I squeezed him to me, then ran a hand over his smooth dark hair. He took after his mother in that way, but his eyes were all his father's. You're such a handsome boy. And so big. You don't look this big when we talk on the phone and wave to each other. Don't get me started. He'll be starting college tomorrow, I swear. Layla smiled a proud mother's smile. Where's Lance? Grant acts as we settled down in our room. More like a suite, I understood the boys had lived in those rooms back in the old days when it was just the four of them. They had obviously needed their space. Our little apartment, which wasn't really so little, could have fit inside Roan's old suite. Out hunting with the guys. He said you were both more than welcome to join them when you got here, Layla explained as she sat on the floor with Stephen, who ran around her in uneven unsteady circles until he fell down with a laugh that made my heart swell. Just being around such a joyful little creature was enough to make me feel younger, lighter. And the girls? I ax. In the kitchen, cooking up a feast. Little Jenny is down there, Layla teased Stephen. Jenny. Jenny. Stephen jumped up and down. I guess she and he are around the same age, huh? I ax. Yeah, Hope had Jenny a month before Stephen came along. And they're like two peas in a pod. We'll have to send out notices to save the date for the wedding, Layla laughed. How's Maggie? I ax. Huge and happy. Due in around a month. You'll just miss it unless she goes early. Nia bounced Stephen up and down on her lap. It was like the old days all over again, the three of us gravitating to each other without having to discuss it first. Grant explored the suite while I gossiped with Nia and Layla, and felt like the time since I saw them dissolved into nothing. Like not a minute had passed, except Layla was a mother and Nia was getting married in two days. The bride-to-be stretched out her long legs and leaned back on her elbows. Did you ever think this would happen? Us settling down into domestic life. I gave it real thought. I remembered the days on the run, going from place to place, never sure how long we would be able to stay. Whether we were safe. I remembered how tightly we had bonded together out of necessity, since we were all we had. But they were all I needed back then. Grant stepped back into the room and I smiled. The diamond ring on my left hand still dazzled me, and I had been wearing it for three months. It never got old. 
I knew it never would. I never saw us with children, I admitted. I mean, we could barely take care of ourselves. How were we going to raise kids? That's true, Layla said, nodding slowly. Even now, I sometimes wonder how we'll do it. Things aren't the same as they used to be, I said. Of course not. But we still work hard to keep ourselves comfortable. It's worth it to see how much we help the kids. Once Layla and Lance had accessed the thumb drive the doctor gave them before we destroyed the lab, they found even more young shifters who needed guidance. They had spent the last year gathering the orphaned kids together and helping them get their lives in order. Jordan and Mary had both helped fund their work, but it was winding down. I knew they would want some place to settle for good. We've all come a long way. Things could have been a lot different, I murmured, looking at Grant. He smiled. I think I'll leave you ladies alone and see if there's any hunting left. Nia instructed him on how to the sunroom, where everybody left their things before shifting and going out. When he left, she turned back to me. So, when are you due? I blinked hard and my jaw fell. What? You heard me. I saw you looking at that baby, holding him, squeezing him. You're pregnant. I wanted to tell her I wasn't. I had a whole plan set up in my head for how I would tell you, I sighed. Layla squealed. You are? I beamed. Um hum. Just found out last week. I was pretty sure the boys could hear us from all the way out in the woods. I would like to make a toast. Jordan stood at the head of the table and he wore the same smile he had worn all night. The long table was full of covered-in food, so full I thought it would break under the weight. The girls had been cooking their fingers off, and I felt a twinge of guilt that I hadn't been there to help, but they swore they loved doing it. He looked up and down both sides of the table. Roan and Hope, with their little girl sitting in a high chair between them. She was already fast asleep. Slate slid an arm around Alice's shoulders and pressed his lips to her head. They had eloped, without anybody knowing while Alice was traveling for a writing assignment. I had already heard a few whispers about them trying for their first baby. Maggie's feet were up on Carter's lap, where he rubbed them for her while she finished off her second helping of roasted chicken. I had never seen a person look as content as she did, except for Carter. On our side of the table, Stephen slept in Lance's lap while Layla smiled that same warm, fond smile I had seen earlier. Nia and Drew practically glowed. I slid my hand into Grant's and he squeezed. We were so lucky. We had everything. Jordan looked like he felt the same way as he looked at all of us. I didn't think this night would be possible, he admitted. When I look back, I remember how sure I was that I'd never find my sons that I would never experience a night like this, looking forward to another wedding, to Nia becoming my daughter. I always thought of her as one, but now it'll be official. I looked at her and caught the tear she wiped off her cheek. And my sons. My nephews. I don't think I've ever been so proud, he continued. I'm proud of the men you've become and the lives you've built for yourselves. I'm proud of Lance and Layla, and all the good work they've done to make life easier on the rest of our extended family. And Grant, becoming a leader in his own clan. Don't think I'm not keeping tabs, he said with a grin. And I know Daniela. He couldn't do it without her right by his side. I wiped my own eyes this time. I love you all so much, he concluded. Thank you for bringing joy back to my life. I hope Nia and Drew and all of you know this same joy for the rest of your lives. We lifted our glasses and touched them to each other. My family. A crazy, irreverent, untraditional family, but still a family. Between them and the Everglades, life would never be dull. And I would never want it to be. I hope you've enjoyed this Ava Benton book. Don't forget to subscribe and to ring the bell to be notified of new releases.